everybody and welcome back to the 2023 Driftmasters European Championship. It is round two. We are here in Sweden and my goodness what a lovely day we have got ahead of us. We've just had our top 32 and we're heading into our top 16 and I brought Dave Egan down here to chat to me because Dave, what on earth happened in top 32? There was just so much to talk about. I mean, First of all, we've got to talk about the battle between Alex Olovnia and Peter Biancek. Yeah, it's, it's a big battle for a turning point in the championship, and maybe early days to call it a turning point. There's still a lot of ground to cover in this championship. But Peter makes an error, and you know, it's a, we always focus in on it, but he makes so few of them. And that's the thing about him as a champion, that you know that he's going to bounce back from this, absolutely. But again, an uncharacteristic error, and it goes to show that Peter Biancek, respecting every driver in this championship by pushing so close, nothing is handed to him here. So he knew how amazing Alex was driving. He had to push a little bit extra. He made a small error, and it's a small error, but it made a big difference, and it knocked him out in the top 32. And a similar error to last year in the same corner. And to be honest, most drivers make a mistake in that corner, which is the slowest part of the track. It is, and let's cast our mind back to 2022, when we were here for the very first drift event which was happening at this track. And it was the battle between Peter and Tor Arne Kavir, where it was literally just here. And he just got blinded by the smoke and ended up in the wrong place on the track, as you can see on the screen here. It was just a small mistake, but it just cost, cost everything. It does, and I think, you know, you could be harsh on Peter Gainsek here and say there's a similar mistake in both, but he's one of the few drivers actually pushing in that area. He's trying to let the battle be in his decision by winning it, by being door to door, by putting on a show, but getting too close can often be a risk not worth taking, and for two years in a row, trying to put on that show has cost him an early exit. But what is drifting if you're not taking risks, Dave? You have to admit that it's it's nothing without those big show-stopping moments. For sure, and that's what we want from a champion. He's not here to just get the job done. He's here to try and put on a show as well and beat everybody with the best of intentions. But it doesn't always work out. It's an unpredictable sport. And if that or top 32 taught us anything, we know nothing about what's going to happen today because everybody we thought was going to win lost or broke down, and we're only halfway through. Now, I don't want to put my money on anybody just yet. But what I will say is, Laurie Heinonen is absolutely flying. I mean, he's fresh off a second place at Mondello. He's come through top qualifying. He's looking so strong out there, and he's ready for his top 16 battle. I mean, we haven't had a chance to chat to Laurie yet. I'm desperate. He's the hardest man to pin down at this track, apparently so. So as soon as I can get him down here, we'll have a chat with him. But talk to me about his driving. He's on rails. He is, and it's going to be very interesting in the top 16. Our first battle is going to be like a final for these guys, because I'll tell you why. Laurie Heinen and Connor Shannon are going, but both going to look at Peter Jainsek's exit as a chance for them to take dominance in the championship. But one of them is not getting past the top 16 here. So that's going to be treated like a final between both. And I've never met two more confident young men behind the wheel of a car like Heinen and Shanahan. That's going to be a war on track. So our top 16 is absolutely so hot out there. I mean, everybody is just waiting to get into their cars. You can see at the parade here, it was just a wonderful display. It's so nice to see everybody out here. I mean, we've got such an amazing array of drivers. Kale Rovenpera, I mean, obviously not the top 32 that he wanted, but the fact that he's here joining us for four rounds this year, that is a huge honor and so exciting. Yeah, and you look at the grid in the top 16 as well. It, it looks like a final. Every single battle there is going to be very toughly contested. And everyone in that top 16 now believes this is their moment. When they see, you know, some of the bigger drivers like Rovenpera, like Vyansek having trouble on this track, they start believing this could be my day this could be the time I go home with the trophy but there's a long way from here to there and a lot of incredible driving we're going to be witnessing over the next couple of hours it is going to be a huge couple of hours and personally I can't wait to see all of the action that is coming up so everybody out there watching make sure you strap in this is going to be a huge event I'm going to let Dave run all the way back up to the tower you, now Becky. it's going to take him a while to get up there so it's going to be a brilliant afternoon make sure you're all ready for this I can't wait to get the action started I'm going to hand it back to Ian Wan Ian. Thank you very much, Becky. Yeah, I am excited to get this one kicked off and underway. An exciting top 32 always leads into an unpredictable top 16. And well, then where would we go from there? The great eight, the final four, the podium. Let's get into it. No fun time for messing around. It's the time for the top 16. Well, here we go, the stage is set, the drivers are ready, the crowd has packed the grandstands, the sun is shining, the light breeze is taking away that disused tire smoke into the distance, and we look down towards the start line when we get ready to see two heavy hitters in European drifting get ready for head-to-head -head battle. It will be Laurie Heinen to take on Ireland's very own Connor Shanahan. These two guys, neither wanting to go out in this top 16. 
all the points available now as Dave and Becky reflected on the exit of Peter Vincek in that top 32 opens up the championship for Laurie Heinen. Can he get the job done? Well, let's take a look at that start list for this top 16. Heinen versus Shanahan, McKeever versus very good friend and fellow pitman Dylan Garvey. Kevin Pursur takes on Vetmark, the local hero, the wild card for this weekend. Pushkonski takes on Maxi. Nakamura takes on Holovnia. Benedict Ascherba will take on Joachim Anderson. Jack Shanahan will take on Pontus Hartmann and Juha Rittenen will take on his fellow countryman Timo Peltola. This one is going to be incredible. Head-to-head -head battles, countries versus countries. No room for error, no messing around. And we take a look inside the cockpit of Connor Shanahan's Toyota GT86 as he warms up the four tires on that vehicle, ready to fire into that first corner. And you can see behind him and alongside him, Laurie Heinen also doing exactly the same. As David Becky said, this one is a battle you'd expect in the final but not the kind of place where Connor Shanahan would want to see it. He pulls up into the chase position. A bad qualifying session yesterday for both of the Shanahans, falling way down in the order, but Connor only having one qualifying run to get the job done. The engine failed and they rebuilt it overnight. Laurie Heinen looking strong. Cool, calm and collected. The flying fin pulls into the lead position. Two 91-point runs. The consistency, the key. And he's looking strong already in his top 32. What can he do against this man? Well, he has the weight of the world on his shoulders right now, Connor Shanahan. He's been fighting for a championship for a few years. He said this year was the year. Will Laurie Heinen and the Finnish driver be the man to take him down? Shanahan edges forward on the handbrake, jumps the start line. Through the chicane they go. Heinen versus Shanahan, the first run of your top 16. Underway, big initiation from Heinen. And he absolutely screams away. There's a little bit of ground between him and Shanahan. But now Shanahan edges up onto the door. Connor Shanahan goes for the kill straight away as they come down the hill in the today outside zone. Shanahan has to break to avoid the inside, to avoid the curb, and now allows Laurie Heinen to put some distance between himself. Shanahan once again finds himself on the inside. They transition back outside zone eight. The whites as they go to the wall. Shanahan on the back bumper. Wow. Well, and just as much as we hyped it up, they delivered. What an incredible run. Dave, welcome back to the commentary tower. Yeah, caught that one in real time on the way up here, and it was fast and it was furious. <laughs> Connor Shannon going for everything on the first corner. That's the highest difficulty part of the track, to be close, and he did. But he paid the price. He got a little too close and had to back off as well. But you know what? He knew the style, the quality of Laurie Heinen, and he had to make it work. And just here, I think he gets lost a little bit in the smoke, but he stays in it. It's not a massive error. It's not a huge deduction. But Heinen's car, just when we get to this Section looks like it's faster than anybody else around here. It certainly does. It looks like it just pulls away and puts some ground between him and Shannon. Look at that big understeer. You can see him winding back the steering wheel as he turns into that final outside zone, slowing the car down. Shanahan going for the kill, looks for the door, just can't seem to get right up onto the front wheel, manages to get onto the back bumper with the door. Uh, Shanahan, though, you know what, doing an incredible job for a man that's been through hell and back last night. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it looks like the engine failure is happening before qualifying, you're dreaming of moments like this to go to a top 16 and be fighting it out again getting both points on the board for the championship. Look, he did really well at the start of the run, really well at the end of the run. In the middle, he lost Heinehan a bit, and that's going to play into the, the strategy of Heinehan now because his spotter is going to have to say to him, look, Connor was on your door the whole first and last section of the course. If you can make the midsection count here, you're going to get the win. And Heinehan will take all that information to this next run and know this is a huge one for the championship. This is what it's all about. You can claw back a lot of points in the early stages of a championship to keep your dreams alive. And right here with a lot of home support from a neighboring Finland, which is just over the border. Heinen has probably more fans in that grandstand than any Swedish driver, and they're willing him on right now. Shanahan is under pressure. He said the car is under pressure, and I think this is going to be fireworks from the off. I think it certainly is, Dave. Well, we've already seen fireworks in the first half of the run. They come through the chicane, through the gears. Shanahan now under pressure in that lead position. Can Laurie Heinen get the job done? He doesn't initiate where we thought he would. Maybe he thought Shanahan was a lot slower. Or is he going to reel him in? He tries to reel him in, but Shanahan does have the pace. Now starts to accelerate away as Laurie Heinen leaves him some room to manoeuvre, doesn't get up close and personal onto the door. Can he rein him in? They transition through in front of the grandstand. Now Heinen starts to apply the pressure, starts to turn the screw. Dangerous transition from Heinen. He dives onto the door. He looks for the side of that Toyota GTA 6. It's not clean from Shanahan in the last out of zone. I'll tell you one thing. It's got, it's got to come back to proximity for me. I mean, Heinen didn't have it through the first section of the course. We talked about Shanahan's proximity through turn one and two. Heinen, he almost gets, 
I think a little caught by the speed of Shanahan's car through those first sections. I'm not sure he expected him to be so fast. Connor, very smooth throughout the course, does make an error towards the end of the run, but it's not a major error. The line is pretty solid the whole way through, and I expected Laurie to be a lot closer on that run than he was. And as you can see, at this point, Shanahan's on throttle. Heinen has to wait. He's on the inside line, and he makes a big dive here, Heinen. Watch this. On the inside, this is good proximity, but he goes on big angle. It slows him a little bit for the transition. It's going to be really in the balance with the judges here. As far as I can tell, two exceptional drivers putting in exceptional runs, and we haven't had a whole lot of that this event so far. What I wanted to see was a good, clean fight between these two guys, and that's what we got. Yeah, we certainly did, Dave. We did get a clean fight. No messing around. Both cars performing 100%. Look at this. Mr. Shanahan has takes a little glance over. He can see Laurie Hyndham right there on the rear bumper.
back towards the start line. And Victor Vetmark will now lead out Kevin Passer for a spot in the great eight awaits. Kevin Passer, though, would love nothing more than to try and prove who he is, the Estonian driver. Yet to really make a move in the championship. Yeah, and the thing is, that, you know, you can make a move now at round two, and you have it's not too late. You, no. you, you can start getting into the conversation very quickly. And I think a lot of drivers are thinking that we will have a big heavyweight battle. I think we're all looking at the Heine and McKeever battle uh, already set up. But this is where it gets interesting, where new drivers can start to, you know, fire up the, the battle order, and all of a sudden they're a contender for the rest of the season. They get that little bit of confidence. Well, Kevin Zor show his little bit of experience here against Vetmark and put in a good chase round. Again, much cleverer off the line here from Kevin Zor as he does match the angle uh, of, or to match the pace off the start line like this right on the back bumper Vetmark with a big angle Vetmark does have a beautiful car I will say but he's uh, he might have a couple of scrapes on it by the end of this run as Kevin Pessora now starts to turn the screw and get a little bit closer it's not really a little wobble from both drivers as they come down not both of them not perfect on that inner zone but the lead run may be affecting the chase run drop of a wheel from Vetmark there as a transition so Kevin Pessora backing off a little bit here a little unpredictable in front of him from the lead he just doesn't want to make any major errors no massive amounts of proximity from either of these drivers. We looked to me like Kevin Bazor just backing away, letting Victor make the mistakes and letting him seal his own fate. Yeah, I think that's exactly what he done. You can take a look at back at the loop replay of this one. And Vetmark doing, you know, everything he could in that lead position to try and claw back as many points as possible. He's way too deep there on the inner zone. That kind of upsets his line to outside zone three because he barely gets there. And as he comes down the hill, we have to handbrake um, all the way through it as you can see there, and that cuts him too close on the inside. It takes too much of a bite at that inside zone, and then he's way wide on that other outside zone. So, a lot of mistakes creeping in yeah. in that lead position. It's all a knock-on effect on this track. You yeah. make one error in one zone, you might get away with it, but it'll punish you later down the line. And Vertmark dropping a wheel off the track. Kevin Pizzor doing the right thing, backing away, saying, this guy might be a little wayward in front of me. I don't want to end up in a collision where I spin out and incomplete. He played a tactical decision there, and I think it's probably going to work out for him over the two runs. Good lead run, didn't do anything majorly wrong in the... And again, the lead run dictating the chase, so the judges will be penalizing Vetmark for all of that, but also rewarding Kevin for avoiding those impacts or, or those things as they went along. So I think this one might be a little easier. Uh, for the judges. Let's see which way they go. Is it as predictable as we think it will be it's for a space in the top eight? And it is Kevin Pazor from Estonia gets the win. Kevin Pazor gets the win and goes through. And uh, they're too busy in conversation to even look at the screen. There you go. There you are, Kevin. You've won it. Well done. He was having a good conversation there, and he will be delighted. First top eight finish for him. And Kevin will be... And this is where confidence is built. It's one of those things, you know? And uh, the mistakes from Vetmark in that lead position probably seen in the deal, I think, for me. Uh, not a clean lead run. And it was no. clean from Kevin. So Kevin's delighted. He gets back in the car. He'll be into the top eight as we move on to a pretty interesting battle lining up here on the star line. Well, where would you see it? You've got a Dakar <laughs> winner and a rally winner going up against a guy from Kuwait, both of them with two JZ-powered cars in Sweden. Welcome no, to Driftmasters. No, one's got a V8 Turbo. Oh, one has a V8 Turbo? V8 Turbo in Ali Max well, that's car. The, the, yeah, well, that makes it all. That really makes it all better. That, that, that fixes wow. the whole situation. So we situation. got Kuba Pushkonski, uh, who has been on rails this weekend, really strong on that GR86. He's gone up against a debutee, which is Max Sheed, never competed before in Driftmasters, could go all the way to the top eight in his first. That would be a dream come true. We're about to kick him off the line and see what happens. Yeah, we certainly are. Through the chicane they go. It's going to be Pushkonski to lead out Max Sheed through the gears. Pushkonski, nice initiation, but Max Sheed's right with him. We've seen Max Sheed do this before in... He's for earlier battles of the day. He goes door to door all the way round, but it's a shallow line from Pushkotsky and it upsets the line of Maxi as they come down the hill. Both avoid the outside zone. Start to get back into it now. Maxi trying to rein back some of that lost ground, but I can only say that that was done by Pushkotsky's bad transition up into the door in the outside zone. They go across the line. Dave, not a clean lead there from no, Pushkotsky. No, it's, it's going to come down to that one moment because the judges are going to say if that cost Maxi to all. Like, watch this. So everything's a okay. We're having a great time. Everybody is where they need to be. Watch Pushkonski in the lead here. He wobbles and straightens a little bit at this point. He's trying to get to that outer zone, but he's kind of straight. He doesn't get there, and he, try, he pushes Max Sheed into the wrong position. Now, the judges are going to decide, was Max Sheed holding on too long? Did he make the error by going too close, or was Pushkonski on the wrong line? I'm looking at it again, saying you could argue for either, because yeah. you could say that Max Sheed stayed too much on the inside of the track and kind of caught himself up a little bit, but you could also say Pushkonski was in the wrong lead position. So uh, the rest of the run is kind of defunct after that, because that's why Max Sheed isn't there, and that's why the advantage to Pushkonski for the rest of the run. It's going to come down to that moment. I think we're going to we're going to hear an explanation from yeah, the judges for, sure. for that and what way they've called. And I think the result is probably going to be a little bit dictated by that. But they have one more run to go. It's not over yet. Uh, but it looks to me like 
it's just those transitions, that qualifying line. Kevin O'Connell, you know, blue in the face talking about this qualifying line. you got to be on it. But a, a fair play to Max Sheed and Pshkonski. They stay in it, they stay on it, and they're door-to-door -door as they go across the finish line. They certainly are door-to-door -door as they go across the finish line. But now we get to swap them around. They make their way back towards the start line, and it will be Ali Max Sheed to lead out uh, Jakob Pshkonski. Pshkonski for me now really needs to be glued to the side of that Nissan 206. I'll tell you why Pishkonski's a little late back to the, to the start line here, because he's got time, they've got two minutes to get back there. He's on the radio, he's talking yep. to his team, and they're not going to be able to give him a clear answer here. Because on first look, it looks like Maxhead's made the big error and he's been left for dead. But then they've also heard probably our commentary and our decision making up here, which is obviously not going to decide anything, but saying there could be an issue with your transition. Yep. So when he comes into this chase position, this is why he's having the longer conversation, because how aggressive does he go? If he's at a disadvantage, he's got to absolutely blow the doors off Maxhead's S15 here. Or does he back away knowing he's got an advantage? I don't think he's going to know that for certain, so he's going to have to go for it. He's going to have to go for it. There is no room for error. He has to make the kill. He has to get the job done, as we like to say. And Max Sheen, he's not going to want to go out of competition this early already on his uh, debut here at the Drift Monsters European Championship. Max Sheen fires through the gears. Big initiation on the handbrake. Straight line initiation. He gets the job done now. Pushkonski starts to push up onto the side. Gives him the room to manoeuvre. This is a much nicer lead from Ali Max Sheen as it allows Pushkonski to tuck up on the inside. But he's on the front nice and early as Max Sheen as he fires through almost two wheels into the grass there as he goes way wide. Pushkonski now looks for the dive off on the inside, looks for the ground, gets into the outside zone, but Max Sheen fires it clean off track. I can't believe what I'm watching. I was just about to say that was an incredible lead run from Ali Max Sheen, and I even thinking it probably put him off because he went straight off the track. That looked to me like some sort of steering issue or mechanical issue because the car just completely shut off power and he flew off the track. And that might have made a very difficult decision for the judges a lot very easier. Very easy, yeah. So it's going to go. Oh, and his wheels on the inside there, Pushkonski as well on the chase. So he was making more mistakes as well in his chase there, Dave. This wasn't going the way that Pushkonski wanted it. Look at the wavering and wobbling. And the lead from Ali Maxid was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, it takes a little bit too much out of it here. Does well not to yeah. go off the track holds on to it, but as he transitions back towards this last section, you can see uh, this is uh, Shkonsi just trying to get in, uh, get the nose in, and then this is where Machid goes a little bit wide, but he doesn't hit those outer cones. Now, just look at the rear end of the car. As he, tra as he transitions in here, that smoke cloud starts to dissipate from the back wheels, and it's 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 game over. Something went wrong with Machid's car there. Um, not too sure what happened. And again, I think that's going to seal his fate here. As Ali Maksheed and Pishkonski wait for the decision, it's for a space in the top eight. And Jakob Pishkonski, Cuba goes through to the top eight. No questions there. And just a quick one, Kevin, because we know it decided itself. But Kevin, what was your call on that, that little bit of a wobble that both drivers had on the first one? To be honest with you, Dave, we were still debating it here. We weren't actually too sure. Um, gut feeling I guess from analyzing it briefly before the second run was that uh, Kuba was actually offline you could see that he had a quite a significant wobble just coming up to outer zone three and that affected him actually getting to outer zone three and then when you see how much proximity Ali had then we were probably going to go with uh, Kuba being at fault and Ali not having room to properly transition at the end of the day we're encouraging drivers to have proximity and to be able to take those risks and with Kuba not being in the correct part of the track and not transitioning in the correct part of the track, we probably would have gone uh, with the side of Ali for that, uh, for that error. Thanks, Kevin. It, it, oh. I, I love how we said, easy decision for the judges, but we'll ask him anyway. <laughs> we'll put a, di a difficult decision. Do you know what, that heartbreaking, it. because it was all Ali Max seat until he yeah. went off track. Look, actually, I shouldn't have asked. It, it would actually you shouldn't have asked. Yeah, it would have, been better, would have been better for all of us. Here we go, back on the line. Alex Halivnia sits alongside, probably a man that he's looked up to for many, many years. Noki Nakamura sits in the lead position in a top 16 at Driftmasters. Dave, could you believe it? And I'm looking at Alex Halivnia going, he woke up this morning, had a slice of toast, and said, it might be Peter Fjern. Like right, Nakamura in one day, and that could be the reality. We don't know. Halovnia is incredibly confident right now, and you look at Nakamura, who we don't know what he feels because he doesn't speak any English. So we can just assume he's having a great time. But what I will say about Nakamura is he's been here and done it before, so he's going to start turning it on from the off. He he is to be on from the off straight away through the gears, absolutely hammering fires that car in. He leaves Halovnia for dead at the moment. As Halovnia has no answer, he's going to go super wide. He holds on to it though true. as he transitions through. Down Very shallow angle, but nice line. Alex Alomnia, no answer at the moment. Yeah. 
ball for. Very slow for your drop by Nakamura. Nakamura trying to wait to see where the transition ends up for Nakamura. Nakamura gets into the outside zone, across the line. Halonia on the back bumper, though. So we've got to take a look back at the replay of this one, Dave. This one, I thought, would have been a lot closer, to be brutally honest with you. Yeah, so here's the problem I have with this, is that... You're analysing it like a robot. You were staring at that then like it was AI breaking it down. Yeah, I was trying to think of it. Now, Nakamura doesn't have a crazy amount of angles for the first of the course, but he's no. super fast. But he, fast. but he makes it work. Yep. He gets all the zones. Lovnia, I don't think, predicted any of that speed. And Nakamura, who's been a little wayward at times in practice, it goes to show that we always talk about Nakamura, you know, from watching so many videos and so all the way back to almost VHS of, of Nakamura. And he's, a, he's, he's all about the chase. Yep. That's his thing. Big angle and chase driving, that's what he's renowned for. But then he went and won a couple of championships in Japan because he tidied that style up and built those other parts of his game. And, you know, the, the, the smooth driving, the angle. Then he's got to come to Drift Masters and completely relearn that because it's a totally different style of drifting. What I'm looking at here is the danger that we've just watched is Nakamura is on the perfect lead line. So now we don't have to worry about his ability in the chase. No. He's figured out what the judges want in the lead line, which now makes him a very difficult proposition for the rest of the grid. And it's taken him a little while. He hasn't got off the mark in Ireland with an engine failure. He's done OK in qualifying here, but qualifying isn't his strong suit. The battles are where it's won and lost. That's where you get the trophies. No one ever got a trophy in qualifying. So it's going to be interesting to see how he goes up against Holovnia here. But remember, Peter Vjansek made the mistake at the end of the run against Holovnia, and Nakamura is going to have to be thinking about that along the way and thinking, oh, I don't want to make the similar mistake here as well. So there's a lot of games being played here. There's a lot of those drivers figuring out what, they, what approach they want. I don't think Nakamura knows anything other than full tilt into this first corner on the door. <laughs> so we're going to be sitting back and watching some expert driving here. We certainly are. Look at this. He's already on the back bump of that BMW F22 as he dives up on the inside of the door. Holovnia fires through, looks for that inside zone. And Nakamura is on the door. He's wobbling and wavering. But can he hold it together? He's a little shallow on the inside. Not what the judges wanted to see. Now now he goes wide, he's lost in the smoke. Ever so slightly straightens there as he transitions. He's on the handbrake once again. He once again finds the door on that BMW F22, but he parks it in the outside zone. On the door goes Nakamura across the line. That is amazing driving from both of those guys. Holovnia stepped the level up, Nakamura stepped the level up, and you could see Nakamura's tactic there. He was winding out angle to be close. The judges are saying, we want to see some proximity. We're encouraging proximity. Well, Kevin, David and Vernon, you got some proximity. That's exactly what Nakamura brought to that battle. Some errors, sure, but lots of proximity. Plenty of proximity. Look at this, look how close he is. I don't think he evades that on-board camera once, but there was some errors creeping in there. Look, he shallows up the angle, mistimes that transition, finds a wheel on the inside. Judges are not going to like that, although he did have that proximity. You could see where the mistakes were creeping in as well. Another mistake here on the middle of the circuit has to reinitiate down onto that outside zone. Yeah, well, the thing is, he's got the proximity, so he's going to get that little level of forgiveness from the judges, yeah. where Holovnia was making some errors, but he was way back. He wasn't having that proximity on Nakamura. So, to me, lead runs look pretty similar. Chase runs, Nakamura's got more proximity and more errors. What does that mean? I have no idea. The judges are going to figure <laughs> that one out. But that, to me, is the, is the story of that battle. It certainly is. He certainly is, and we're going to learn, and he's going to learn. Nakamura is going to learn this European style more and more as these events go on. This is only the first time we've seen him battle in Europe. Yeah, and it's amazing to me. I was just looking at it, looking at the Japanese flag, the Israeli flag, and the Kuwaiti flag all blowing in the wind at a European championship. Amazing, bringing nations together. Which nation will go through to the top eight? It's going to be Japan, and it's going to be Naoki Nakamura getting the win and going through to the top eight. The first time his car works, he makes a top eight. A lot of people wondering how this, this man was going to get on here in Europe, but well, I think he's a problem now. He certainly is a problem now, Dave, and he's proving that more and more. He's in the great eight, and he's looking stronger and stronger run by run. Yeah, just quickly back to you, Kevin, if you've got a moment just to talk us through that decision. Uh, did it come down to that proximity in the end? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dave. It definitely did come down to the proximity, uh, but it was a lot closer than uh, you'd actually think. While Naoki did have a lot of proximity, he was making a lot of errors in that chase run too. Uh, Hlovnia, he was, uh, didn't have that proximity 
proximity, but he wasn't making any of those waivers or anything like that. He did do a little bit of cutting of the track too, but I think if uh, Nakamura wants to get all the way to the final, he's definitely going to have to clean up his chasing runs from here on out. Well, there you go. Big statements from Kevin O'Connell. Kevin O'Connell. Telling Nakamura Telling to clean Nakamura. up his chasing. Mm. Clean it up. Clean it up, son. Get your mop and bucket. Clean it up. <laughs> well, Nakamura won't care. He's into the top eight, and he's going to have the winner of Anderson and Cherba to come up against, and there's another big battle. Cherba. He's bruised from a lot of punches with uh, Zamic in the uh, top 32, but he's here. He almost threw it away, but he fought his way back into the top 16. As I said, he's going to have to be a little bit more clinical in his driving and clean up some of those errors. I'm sure he's had a good look back at the replays and, and the judging decisions at top 32. These guys watch what you watch as well. Don't remember that, folks. All the drivers are watching the same broadcast you are, so therefore they're learning as, as, uh, along with everyone else is driving. So Anderson, he's the hometown hero. He's been very on it. Look at the running. He's taken on Cherba here. He knows Cherba's fast and he's jumped off the light very quickly. These guys are going for it. Yellow, black and white body panels everywhere. Well, it won't matter who hits who right now because it's all the same colour as they fire in. And Benedict to Sherpa puts foot to floor, but Joachim Anderson does not leave him. He absolutely fires through. Big transition, though. Joachim Anderson's going to have to try to deal with that one, and it gives Benedict to Sherpa the opportunity to try and drive away now as we lose Sherpa as he fires through past the grandstand. He is up and gone. And Joachim Anderson, I'm not sure if he shut that car down with an issue, and he has. Yeah, he's jumped across the grass very violently. I think it's completely destroyed the front end of the car. What happened there was all, again, that transition from the first to the second corner. Anderson goes on big angle, puts himself completely in the wrong place, and he drives straight over the grass. Couldn't even see it, Dave. Couldn't see it for tire smoke and Benedict just well, that's disappearing. The, that's the beauty of Red Bull TV, Ian. I can show you exactly can what happened. We see it right now. You were watching Cherba, I was watching Anderson, and Cherba is very fast. So Anderson, look at this. Watch the transition right about here from Anderson. Look at the, look at the angle, wait. Wrong, completely wrong. He's on massive angle. Now look where the car is facing, inside of the corner. And look, two wheels straight up over the curbs, and that's going to completely destroy the front of the car. Steering, everything goes, and Anderson knows at that point something's up. He could have bent the tie rod, something happened. You'll see it more dramatic oh, here. It's wow, a big yeah. bump. But I think at this point, not only does he know that he can't get back into the fight, but he's got an issue with the front end of the car. And like you can see it here, look, look at the violence. He's on one wheel there, surely. And everything just shatters on the front of the car. Um, so from that perspective forward, either he's broken something or he's just shut it down because he knows he's lost that battle anyway. Wow. And there's me just watching Benedictus Cherva's car po almost poetry in motion. go into space. He yeah. was as fast as the jet in the uh, top 16 yeah, show. We had a jet fighter show here earlier on and the jet fighter actually came up and said, uh, I don't think I Will drive, I don't think I drive Cherba's car. It looks a little fast for Will me. Will you slow it down? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. frighteningly fast. So we are hearing in our headsets, so unfortunately, Joachim Anderson won't make the second run. The car is out of action. Becky, Dave, is with Joachim Anderson. Oh. Absolutely, guys, I am with Joachim. And he's just said to me, I can't catch a break. What do you mean by that? I mean, that was such a big hit as you went over the curb there. Did you feel the steering is bent? Is What's happening with the car? No, when I transitioned from out of zone three, uh, yeah, the car just flicked on massive angle and then uh, I couldn't really, yeah, I don't know how to say, but drive from there. And then when I yeah, went over the curb, after that, the diff broke. Uh, so it was the diff that broke that's let you down? Yep. Well, you know what? You're going to come back for the fight next round in Finland. We're really excited to see you there. Are you excited for that round? Uh, yeah, very much. Well, I hope you get the car fixed and we'll see you very soon. Thank you, Joachim. Yeah, could have fooled me with the excitement, Becky. I think he's, he's pretty in the moment right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's, I don't, I think it's going to give, take a couple of beers and a couple of chats to get him out of that mood because he was flying all weekend. Diff braking, I'm mean, getting big impact on the back end of the car. Tough on these cars when they take the, and they're all so low to the ground because they look so cool and it works. Yeah. When you go off the track, not good. Not to, so good. Not so good. They're to not be that designed low. for rally cross. That's the problem. They're not designed for this, uh, that kind of off-road racing. Don't no, you? and it's pretty harsh off this track because yeah. it's been dug up a little bit by practice and by qualifying and by some battles. We've got Johnny Sweeps out on the track, just making sure that uh, surface is absolutely A-OK. -okay. Um, and Cherba's car, I mean, it is... The funny thing about Cherba is it's kind of like spinning the wheel off the start line, just going, I wonder what Cherba I'm going to get, because when he's on it, he's the best on this grid, but he can't seem to match that consistency all the time. And I think once he gets into a flow of an event, I was just which, say. Is, which is where he seems to be now, he's unbeatable. But it's getting to that flow. It's almost getting past qualifying, and the top 32 battle is nearly all Benedictus Cherba needs to yep. start building building that confidence. And I'm going to say he's quite similar in that uh, regard to Jack Shanahan. I think Jack Shanahan's qualifying 
dictates kind of his mood going forward. If he gets a, a not a good qualifying, and then he gets, you know, some of those guys need to build the confidence through the track, as they call it, getting in the groove. Yep. And maybe those extra runs with... Uh, with Zamich for Cherba, allowed him that extra time to start figuring things out in, in the, the car. Because yeah. he looked pretty unstoppable there. And Anderson is, is no walkover by any means, but Anderson will learn. I mean, yes, the diff broke. I still think it was kind of not, I mean, he didn't get the second run, but I think it was kind of out of his hands at that stage. When he's going across the grass, he's going to get a you know, zero on that run or an incomplete. So therefore, he's probably at a massive disadvantage anyway. So he kind of sealed his own fate, but that massive flick of angle, I'm not sure what that was, but they're trying to figure that the car has come to a complete stop on the track by the looks of things uh, on the way back up to the pit area. Yeah, it looks like a, dif a differential just letting go on the car. So unfortunate. And I'm sure the Swedish fans here in attendance will not be happy no. one of their Swedish uh, drivers has gone out of competition. However, it's early days, a lot of uh, twists and turns to go, and Cherba will go back to the start line. All he has to do is initiate the corner, and he takes the win on this occasion. He certainly does. And uh, look, talking about Benedictus Cherba and how he's feeling at the moment, he's probably feeling good, but he'll feel a lot better once he's had the great eight battle, because he'll be going up against Naoki Nakamura. I mean, this is amazing. We're seeing... Nakamura against Churba. Well, it's assuming that Churba assuming. initiates the first corner, which I really I hope he does. I can't see that he's not going to. Yeah, I, I, would, I would bet the house on this. But what I will say is that <laughs> what a championship where you put a Lithuanian champion against a Japanese champion and see what happens. That's the beauty of Drift Masters. That's why we love it. And you can't predict it at all. And Churba flying in. There's another lap, another free lap for him to figure out that lead run. And you know what? It looks like he's got it well figured out. He certainly has got it well figured out. I'm taking a look out the window seat for the ripple time and not from the monitor. Look at this. Churba absolutely Dave is, if he could have done this yesterday in qualifying, he would have been way up there. He, I mean, look, he was already seventh, but I'm going to say this was better than his qualifying run. Oh, that's a 90-plus run for me there. That's unbelievable. But again, he's had a lot more laps since then, and he's starting to figure that car out. I mean, it's his old car, but they've still had to do a little bit of, you know, this track, a lot of guys saying, you know, the gear ratios, what sort of tire pressures you run, you might be super fast for the first bit, but then you're really struggling to get spin the wheels at the end when it's slower. you got to find that balance of gear changing. It looks to me like uh, Benedict Sherba doing a good job. He's still a little early on the handbrake. Hand yeah. He's kind of got that bad habit from earlier on. But again, if he's so fast up to that point, it doesn't matter. It's not affecting the chase car. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how he gets on against Nakamura. I'm looking forward to that one. I mean, we have some huge battles. We've got Heinen against McKeever in the top eight. We've got Pazur against Kubo Pshkonski. Nakamura against Cherba. We're talking final, final, final. Here we are already. We're not even through with the top 16. And only two of those people were on the podium at the final round. There we go. We're making the, uh, the decision official. It will be Benedict Cherba from Lithuania making the move into the great eight. Yeah, no surprise there, Cherba. Uh, gets through and this is going to be another interesting one because you start to look at this on the paper and you say Jack Shannon coming in here as the favorite but on a day like today anything can happen and Pontus Hartman he's taken down Oren Nielsen he's now feeling confident he's in the top 16 he's had a great first round Pontus Hartman with a top eight finish if I'm not mistaken yep. he could replicate that again if he goes through Jack Shannon but that's easier said than done and Jack Shannon we haven't watched him be tested too much just yet he had a great battle with Kevin Piscolti but Piscolti making some errors he's now going to have to be on his A game here for and again, remember, championship points on the line for all of these drivers. We're going to start thinking about that. Jack Shannon in that lead position. Here we go. Here we go through the gears, through the chicane. They go. Jack Shannon had to lead out Pontus Harman. Pontus Harman goes up onto the inside, looks for that inside line, tries to dive in and get a clear view down the side of that Toyota GT86. But Shanahan's on a ripper as he goes right to the edge of the circuit, onto the handbrake, perfectly timed. Pontus Harman taking a clever chance here and staying on that qualifying line. Looks to regain some ground now as he shortcuts the outside zone, almost makes contact goes for the dive in the final outside zone and Shanahan lights up the tyres Hartman's with him across the line yeah textbook Shanahan and that's that's what that is I mean he's gone out there he's put in a phenomenal run he actually makes a little bit of an error for me but he he's so good that you wouldn't notice it because he actually handbrakes a little earlier to extend yeah. his own but he makes it work even when he's in the wrong part of the track sometimes this is absolutely beautiful from Shannon but watch this as he comes back he pulls the handbrake here just to adjust his line not major mistake but again it doesn't affect Hartman so the judges aren't going to be too hard on him for it. After that, Shanahan is really fast through the course. i got to give it to Pontus Harman, though. He doesn't fall out of favour. He stays in the game. He still has a fight here with Shanahan, but he's putting the track quite excessively to do it. Um, I think advantage Shanahan maybe after the first run, but Pontus Harman's still very much in this one. He certainly is. And look at this. He goes for the dive up to the door. See Shanahan in that outside zone. Just takes a little look up onto the inside and says, well, that'll be a job done for today. 
Yeah, and I think this is, you know, another driver, and I mentioned Shanahan in the same breath as Cherba, where once they get in the groove, once they start to feel comfortable, they start to produce, they start to get confident, and then they start to do better runs than you've seen in qualifying, and better lead runs, and I think Shannon's best run in the lead position was probably that one of all the runs we've yeah. seen today. So he's getting better as the runs go on, Cherba's getting better as the runs go on, and you know what, that's where we're seeing these guys use their experience to learn fast as they go. What does Pontus Harmon do in this position? Well, he's at a disadvantage, he's got to put in a solid lead run. The lead run has to be exceptional. But Shanahan is going to be right there on his door. Now, we've watched Jack Shanahan pull off some amazing chase runs. We've also watched him make some mistakes in the chase position. He's going to have to manage that aggression here if he wants to get through to the top eight. Shannon's definitely got his eyes on the prize and his eyes on two times at this track winning. And he'd be the only man to ever win a drift event at this event after two events. <laughs> that would be an amazing achievement. But Pontus Hartman's not going to lie down here. He certainly's not going to lie down. Well, we get the green light to go. Hartman to lead out Jack Shanahan for a spot in the great eight. Waits through the gears. Goes Pontus Hartman. He want to get this one done for the Swedish fans. But Shanahan... Won't let him go down without a fight. They fire through Honest Hartman on that qualifying line. Shanahan almost backs it in as they transition. Shanahan loses a little ground there, but now starts to raid it back in. He's shallow as he comes down in front of the grandstand. Honest Hartman absolutely drives away, and now Shanahan has to shortcut the outside zone. He dives in outside zone eight. Hartman wanders and wavers in that zone, and across the line they go. Very interesting battle. You know, I think that's another case of going too close on the first corner. Shanahan goes right in there, he's in the pocket, you can barely see him. And as he's close to the lead car, Hartman is on the right line as far as I can see it. I mean, it, it looked to me like he was doing a pretty okay job, but Shannon gets caught a little on the inside and he has to transition in an uncomfortable position. Uh, does a good job of staying in the fight, doesn't make a major error, but watch how close Shannon gets here. And then he's got to back off dramatically. And as he transitions here, Shannon, watch this. Hartman gets the zone. Shannon transitions earlier than Hartman, which means now Shannon's facing towards the inside of the track. Does a good job of staying in it, doesn't make any major errors. Does follow Hartman, but Hartman's got the run out of the corner. And that's where Hartman puts the pain in. He's starts to, to take away from Shannon. Shannon then does a late transition. So where I would have said an advantage to Shannon on the first run, Hartman definitely staking the claim on the second. Oh, I'd like to throw my cards in the air for this one and just say I'd like to see it go one more time. You know, from where I'm sitting right now, it, it, you know, there's no clear winner here. I'd say there's so no clear winner. it's going to come down to some technicality from the judges, and they're going to have a look at the lead runs from both drivers, which look to be pretty solid. And the chase runs from the both drivers. The chase runs from both drivers, which had moments of proximity and then moments of And if we're talking about lead to lead, chase to chase on that kind of basis, and we're talking about it technicality style, I'd say that Pontus Hartman made less mistakes in his lead than Jack Shanahan did. It could be ca a case for it, but then Shannon has a lot more proximity yep. in the chase run at, through the first part of the course than Hartman has at any point on the course. So there you go. Again, judges are going to have to weigh up proximity versus mistakes. Thank, thank God we don't have to. <laughs> well, there we go. The Swedish flag is flying in the house, ready for, to get that decision. They're hoping that their Swedish film and Pontus Hartman gets the win and moves through into that great eight. But... There are three men upstairs, Dave, that have that decision in their hands right now. Yeah, you see uh, the Swedish fans having a lot of fun. We're having a lot of fun with the Swedish fans here in, uh, in Falforce. They're a great bunch of people. They, they absolutely love their motorsport, love their drifting. We've had a blast since we've got here. Uh, we're still waiting on nighttime, which hasn't come at all this week. But, uh, it's not available. It's not available. It's, uh, it's checked out of the conversation. <laughs> so it's just daytime all the time during the night. But it's a uh, decision in which way is it going to go. And it's going to be... Jack Shanahan getting the win, and you can see the relief in his face there because he wasn't so sure. No, he even said what himself. Yeah, I mean, Jack Shanahan's pretty hard on himself most of the time. Kevin, I'm going to throw it up to you very quickly. A tough one to call, it looked like, for us. Very tough one to call, Dave. Drivers really not making it easy for us today, I must say. Uh, lead to lead, very similar. So for us, it really all comes down to the chase runs there. And in our opinion, uh, Jack had very good proximity on the first corner. Yes, he made a mistake on the tr first transition and fell back a little bit but he regained that proximity without massively deviating from the qualifying line then for the final corner as well. Whereas Pontus, unfortunately, he didn't really have much proximity and to try and gain that proximity, he was cutting a huge amount of zones off the top of my head, zone one, three, four, and uh, seven and eight. So you can't be gaining that proximity or that advantage. We award that uh, aggression from Jack Shannon and he just about gets the win. Well, there you go, Jack Shannon creeping through, but he is through, and Becky is down on the grid with our drivers. A lot of emotions spilling over down there, Becky. Absolutely, Dave, but there is a big smile on Pontus's face right now because even though you might not have got through this top 16 battle, you're still sitting eighth in the championship, and you're feeling good. That's what you just told me. Yeah, I'm feeling great. Um, of course, it's a shame going out in top 16 in Sweden, 
But yeah, I know Jack is super fast and I had to try yeah, more than I have. And uh, my chase haven't been spot on, but I tried and I was super blind the whole first part of it. But I knew he's fast so I could just pin it. And when I came out with the smoke, he wasn't in the way. So yeah, it feels, it feels great, it does, yeah. So uh, good points. Uh, yeah, for, so yeah, hopefully everything goes well. And the battle you had with Aura Nielsen earlier, I could see you were just so delighted to see him out on the track. No matter what happened there, it was just a great moment for the sport. Yeah, I mean, a Scandinavian body, and it's heartbreaking to roll over like that. And also, I didn't want that win to, to be a one word uh, or a Byron. I just want him to get out there uh, so we could do it up out here. And he did an amazing job for doing what happens before. So, yeah, I think it was a close one there as well. So, yeah, super proud of his team for doing what they did, getting me back out. It was, a, it was a pleasure to ride with him. That's a lovely sentiment. Thank you so much, Pontus. We'll see you next time. Now, Jack, wowee, that first corner, you backed it in. Yeah, it was a fairly full sin, to be honest. The car was really, really hooked up in the lead run. Um, we just, I just knew I had to throw it all at it, you know, and I haven't done like a solid lead run yet, so I'm kind of taking every lap as it comes and just, uh, just trying and trying and trying, I guess. But yeah, no, it was a good battle all the same, so happy enough. Good luck, Jack. Maybe this uh, it's time for round two. We'll see. see you soon. Thanks, Becky. And there we go. Jack Shanahan gets the win, advances through into the great eight. Pontus Hartman still happy, but still upset that he never got to fully battle Oren Nielsen. That is just how much it means to these guys. We go back to the start line, though, to the next battle, the final battle of our top 16. It will be Yuha written to take on Timu um, Peltola. Two good friends. Two sworn enemies, like most of these guys. They're friends in the paddock, but when you get them on the racetrack, the visor goes down, it is battle time. Peltola sits in that Mercedes-Benz wagon, diesel-powered, 3.2-litre straight-six twin-turbo, 1,200 newton-metres of torque car. Does it make sense? It never does at the Driftmasters European Championship. He slots through the gears, and lead him in will be Yuha Ritten in this incredible GR86. Ritten and fires through and starts to already put some ground between himself from a team who now as they fire through per Pertola struggling with that transition just can't get it right now the ground starts to open up massively as you are written and looks down in front of the grandstand fires through looks for the final transition team who just can't get back any lost ground as written and looks for the wall gets the job done across the line I'm going to bring back to a conversation that Ian and I had earlier on today and I started to talk about you her and saying you know what everyone's sort of He's quietly going about his business, but he's like a fin in the water for me because, and I didn't I like him. You see what I mean? Yeah, I like him. So the reason for, uh, I'm saying that is because he's so fast, but he's so consistent, and it's just really shown there how fast he is on this track because he left uh, Timo so far behind on that that I don't think there was anything he could have done differently. There was just so much speed in that GR86. It's incredible. And I think that's the, you know, it's one of those aces in the hole that, that, that Rinton has. It seems like he's got an 11 switch on that car that he can just <laughs> go faster than everybody else. And right now, it takes a huge advantage into the second half of this battle. So from that perspective, I'm just saying, don't sleep on Yuha Rinton right now. I mean, I've got to watch a chase run to really feel confident about it. But he's another driver that, you know, hasn't made any mistakes this weekend. He's looked very solid. You could look at Heine in the same light as well, making very little mistakes, and we're going to see them come up in the top eight. But from my perspective, if you look at uh, Potola's position, he just didn't have the pace there, just couldn't catch him. No, Potola really didn't have anything in that one. It was all the way from the initiation. He kind of got a little bit lost there on the initiation and just couldn't catch up. And once you give you hard written an, an inch, it will take the whole track, and he'll be across the finish line before you've even thought about pulling that handbrake. Yeah, he's not an easy man to talk to because he's so far ahead of you. <laughs> he's just, you know, and, and the thing about you, is he, he's very calculated. He's a, he's a real professional driver. He, he thinks about things. He, he doesn't overcommit, and that sometimes can be his detriment. He doesn't risk too much, which means that he doesn't often get those door-on-door -door battles. Like we, but again, once he's in the zone, and it depends on the track, and I've, I've talked about this with some of the judges, some of the Scandinavian drivers like you, Harrington, they come alive on these faster tracks. This is very much a Scandinavian track. Big corners, lots of power, lots of speed. For some of you know the Western European drivers, I'm very used to tight technical circuits, and we've got a mix of all across this calendar. But I think Mandela would suit a new home incident, but this circuit definitely does. So let's see what he does in the chase position. And for uh, Pozzoli, he's just got to put a, a really good lead run in here. But then you are into it, could have the car gripped up enough that it might be difficult to follow a slower car in that Mercedes diesel. And by slow, I mean at 1,200 Newton meters and very, very fast. <laughs> so I mean that in relative terms. Relative terms, It ain't yeah. slow by any means. But it's going to be interesting to see how Rinton manages the aggression here. Does he play it safe or does he actually risk a little bit? I'm always wondering which Rinton we're going to get in the top six.
16. I think Rindon's going to go for it. I think he's going to risk it. He wants to get into that great eight. He knows Jack Shanahan awaits in that great eight battle. They're off through the gears, down. They come through that start line. Peltola looks for the initiation, flicks that wagon across the circuit, gets on the throttle. Now he starts to put some ground between himself and Yuha Rittenden. But Yuha Rittenden stands on the accelerator and draws him in like a fish on a fishing line, drags him in down the outside zone. They look for the inside zone over the crest of the hill they come. And Peltola transitions and once again begins to drive away. But Yuha Rittenden won't let him escape for too long as they get into that final outside zone. Rittenden looks for the door and he gets onto it in the front wheel across the line. Impressive stuff. And I was just about to say how Rittenden saw where he was going at all on that outer zone three because he was completely clouded in, in black and white smoke because he had no idea. Watch this from Rintanen. He does allow a little bit too much for me at the start, but the pace of the car gets him back into this. Now, this is the moment for me that's incredibly impressive. Watch Rintanen's windscreen here as they transition. He can see absolutely nothing for this whole section, and he's doing it all on muscle memory. A lot of drivers go off the track, make big mistakes. He stays in it. He trusts that Timo Piltola is a good driver and he's going to do what he needs to do. And as they pop out of the smoke, he's right there. And as you can see, Rintanen and cutting the track, not dramatically, but getting back into it. But then this is the bit of proximity we didn't see from Piltola at the end, which is right up onto the door. I've got to say, I give big shout out to Timu here because he's done Cool shots and stuff on this car, producing smoke from every single side. I love the way it's coming out of the rear door. Yeah, it comes out That's of the rear really door, cool. comes out in front of the windscreen. It's almost like a little train. Choo-choo, <laughs> going down the track. Amazing. So uh, you can see a you are into it's like, I don't know what's going on. It, it, I could see, I couldn't see. Uh, but they're going to get a decision from the judges. It's going to be for a spot in the top eight. Who is going to take on Jack Shanahan? We're about to find out. It is going to be Yuha Rintanen gets the win. Yuha Rintanen gets the win and goes through to our top eight. Rintanen, and I mean, for me, it looks like... Uh, I'm going to go quickly over to Kevin. Kevin, it looked to me a little bit like uh, it was just that bit of proximity. That little bit of proximity from Yuha at the end was probably the turning point. Yeah, it absolutely definitely does come down to proximity and those lead runs relatively similar. Um, a couple of mistakes there, by, but um, overall, it all really came down to Yuha's proximity. He had just the right amount of aggression that he had, had to do to take the win overall. Yep, I'd say uh, Yuha rented and delighted with that. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll find out from the man himself. Becky is with Yuha. He's into the top eight. Phenomenal driving from the Finn. Yeah, absolutely brilliant driving. And I just said to Yuha, that looked like a lot of fun, and he nodded his head. I have to ask the question, you're dodging tyre smoke, but then also the black smoke from the diesel as well. What is that like? It's very difficult. Like, like just now driving through the smoke, I couldn't see anything for maybe four seconds, just keeping floored in and hoping that he wouldn't be there so I wouldn't hit him. But yeah, there's an extra factor with Temu with the black smoke also. Sometimes we, I don't have any side windows, so the black smoke comes straight at me. So I have to wipe my visor <laughs> from the smoke. It's good, great fun. Always fun to battle a fellow Finn here. Can you feel the support from all of your Finnish, uh, Finnish fans? Yeah, for sure. For sure, there's lots of Finns here, so it's good to see the support, and I think Finland will be even crazier, so. Excellent, we look forward to seeing everybody in Finland. See you soon. Well, we're back uh, in a few moments' time with our top eight, and I'm just trying to do the math on this. So we've got two Finnish, we've got two Irish, we've got an Estonian, we've got a Japanese, and a Lithuanian in the top eight. So try and figure that one out. It seems like this is very much a mixed championship of many different nations, and we have got an incredible lineup for that top eight. Heinehan beats Connor Shannon. Big move for him. He goes up against Dwayne McKeever. Everyone's going to be keeping an eye on that one. Then we've got Kevin Pajor and Pishkonski, who will all, one of those will go to the top four, and that's going to be a very tough battle. Chirba and Nakamura, another massive battle. And then you got Jack Shannon against Yuha Rintanen. Well, if you're not really, really excited for that, I don't know if you're a Drift fan, because that is some incredible drivers, a mix of chassis, performances, and everything all mixed together. And now we only find out of those eight, three that will stand on the podium. But none of those guys care about the podium. They care about one place on the podium, and that's top spell. And we are coming to that very, very shortly. So from my perspective right now, I'm thinking, if you look at the championship chase, Heinehan, McKeever, and Shanahan, 
are kind of the three guys that are thinking more about the championship than everyone else. The rest of the guys, by the end of this round, could very, very well be in that championship mix. With just two rounds and that's the amount of points on the board, could we see a Nakamura or Cherba? Could we see a, a, a Rintanen? Could we see a Pishkonski or a Pizora all jump up into the top five in the championship? It'd be pretty incredible. This is going to be very interesting because right now, of all of these drivers you're looking at right now, only Jack Shanahan and Dwayne McKeever have won a round of Driftmasters before. So you're going to get some interesting matchups here, and we may see a brand new winner this evening if those guys. And then, remember last year, McKeever and Shannon were in the final, and that could happen technically again if it all worked out for them. But I'm not going to count out anybody else in this, because Heinen looks to me like a man that wants to go two podiums for two here, and that would be incredible. So what I'm thinking right now is we have a top eight in front of us that is ready to shake the, the, the sheer foundations of drifting because the Japanese champions are in there, the European champions are in there. We've got UK champions, we've got Finnish champions, we've got them all in the mix now. And all your conversations for many years of who's better, well, we're about to find out who is the best over the next hour or so. All we've got to do is sit back, enjoy and watch. These guys are the ones under the pressure. And we hope you guys are enjoying every minute of this incredible event. And from my perspective, we're going to see things in the next hour that we've never seen before in the championship. And that's what makes this championship so exciting. I will say from my perspective, right now that an unpredictable winner here is not beyond the realm of possibility with the way this competition has been going so far but we'll see how it all plays out we know that McKeever and Heinen are ready to kick off that top eight they're both warming up as it is and we are in for a very special kickoff as these two guys definitely believe they're good enough to win this Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to round two of the Driftmasters European Championship here in a beautiful, sunny, and very close to the Arctic Circle, Drive Center Arena in Sweden, where the action is thick, is thick and fast all the way through the weekend, but now we've got to the penultimate end of our series, where it is the top eight, great eight, and there's eight drivers from four, four different nationalities that are ready to try and step on the top step of the podium. Now, this is a action-packed season we've got for you guys. It is going to be all across Europe with many different circuits and very, very different challenges. We've already been to Mondello Park where winner and current champion Peter Vjansek took the top step, but he went out in the top 32 here in Sweden earlier on. And here we are, obviously, in the Drive Center Arena, which is proving to be a very tough, challenging track for everybody. But what also will be tough is on the 7th and 8th of July, we're going to the Power Park in Finland, around a theme park where drifting's happening. Doesn't have to make sense. It won't. It might. Who knows? We're then heading to the party central of Europe, Riga Lafia, for a very challenging challenging and fast circuit. Then we head to the Iron Drift King on the Iron Island for Feropolis in Germany. And then the biggest drift event in the world, in world history of drifting, it is the Pegae Narodowe in Poland, where 50,000 seats will be filled by drift fans to see who wins this championship. But the road to the championship has proved to be a rocky one for our current champion, Peter Vjainczak, as in the top 32, a quick transition and trying to be as exceptional as possible, led him to push a little too hard and run into 
Alex Holivnia and knock him out across the finish line. The judges had a good deliberation on it and then they voted for Alex to go through. Vianse goes out in the top 32, which hasn't happened too often, but it is very early in the season, so do not count him out for a big charge from here on in. Expect our current and reigning two-time champion to be very hungry when we come to Finland to get back up on that podium. Even the best make mistakes, and that shows the level that we're at in drifting in Europe right now. And it's going to be an amazing top eight ahead of us. We have got some of the best drivers in the game and some that have never even been in this position before in a competition. First timers, we've got new guys who, and also we have the two guys that came first and second last year still in the mix. All to play for, but let's look at the track that these guys will be attempting to make a name on. This is a tough track. This is really, really tough. It's Valfors in Sweden. It is an incredible facility. Brand new track with two deceleration zones, six outer zones, and two inner zones. The track length is 640 meters long. It's first, second, third, fourth gear off the start line. As much speed as you can get into that first outer zone one. Then you're full on the throttle. Then you got to pin the nose of the car towards inner zone two. That'll push you perfectly on full throttle out to outer zone three. You're still on full throttle at this point, ladies and gentlemen, as you go past outer zone four and into the first deceleration zone we get the nose of the car in towards inner zone three this is a really tough part of the track a lot of guys struggling with this and going off the circuit it's the unnatural race line as you head to outer zone seven then into the last deceleration zone as you whip the car's direction into that big pull towards that big immovable concrete wall at the end of the circuit as you can see this is where drivers are going to get door to door up close to personal and where battles have been won and lost on this circuit before that is what they're up against three judges kevin o'connell vernon and david will be making the call and we're heading towards our top eight my name once again is dave egan i'll be talking you through all the action with my good friend ian Waddington. ian what i'll tell you what is look at this top eight grid and tell us what it means to you well, look at it. Just just take a look at it. For instance, Dave, Toxic Scene was absolutely stacked. We had some door-on-door -door battles all the way through, but now things start to heat up. Laurie Heinemann takes on Dwayne McKeever, the man that was on the podium here last year, and the man that was on the podium just a few weeks ago in round one at Mondello Park. Jakub Pushkonski takes on Kevin Pascua. Both these guys haven't made it as far through as the final four yet. Who will be the decider of that one? Benedict Ascherba, he's looking to take down a Japanese superstar. Naoki Nakamura stands there saying, I ain't here to play this year. Year. You are written and the old school guy. Well, he looks down at Jack Shanahan saying, You might be the young man that's had a lot of podiums, but I've been here for a long time. It's time to do the deed on the track. Yeah, the fans are ready, the marshals are ready, we're ready, and the judges are ready. We hope you guys are ready as well because I'll tell you what, we are in for an hour or so of incredible drift action here on one of the most challenging layouts ever perceived in Europe. Guys, the time for talking is over, the time for driving is here. Let's head to the top eight. We start off with the most interesting of battles. Right now, Laurie Heinen, if my math is correct, will be sitting top right now of, of the, the championship. championship. With McKeever finishing up in fourth position at round one. These are guys that came second and fourth at round one, and now they go up against each other in the grade eight. So whoever wins this is going to get mega points. And we, one of these guys could be our top championship contender at the end of today. But they go head to head so early in the competition. This is what it's all about. McKeever, I watched him. He was there for the last half an hour waiting for this battle. Why Heinen was still working on the car. Does that mean anything? Does it mean nothing? We don't know. What we mean is they're both hungry. They're both ready. Finland versus Ireland is the first battle in our top eight. And Laurie Heine gives a thumbs up and said, you think the last couple of battles were good? Well, you're about to see something special here. McKeever says, I don't care who you are, where you're from, I'm going for your door. Here we go, top eight at round two. Here we go through the gears, down they come. This one means everything for the championship right now. McKeever doesn't want to let Heinen and get away, but Heinen tries to escape the grip from Dwayne McKeever, but he just can't shake the Irishman as they fire through. Outside zone three for Field. They come down the hill, and Dwayne McKeever is closer than anyone else has been around this circuit so far. And now starts to put some ground between himself and the Irishman as Heinen and absolutely fires through. But McKeever is still there. He's out of the outside zone. They're wandering and waving. But the job is done for the first half. Wow, incredible battle between Laurie Heinen and Dwayne McKeever as McKeever goes closer than any other driver in this competition for the weekend. He risked it and it worked out. Now, obviously, he's got a very fast and competitive driver ahead of him to, to aim for. It just worked so beautifully. This transition at the end, uh, one of the transitions at the end for me from McKeever was 
sensational, but McKeever so close the whole way through the circuit, doing the right thing, staying a little bit ahead of the lead car, so you can see he doesn't get clouded by that, that smoke cloud, and he stays with him though, loses a little bit of ground through the midsection, but then he risks it all at the last, the last transition for me between these two guys was sensational from McKeever, watch, gets up close to Percy, I think he's going to make contact, little left foot break, boom, comes through the smoke, up onto the door, Heinen's on that perfect outside line, McKeever starts to turn the screw, and he's up on the quarter panel as they go across the line, this is top rate stuff, Ian. It certainly is top race stuff, Dave, and these two guys are here for busy. Look at that. Hand movements in the car. He let go of the steering wheel completely. He wasn't even holding on to it when he pulled the, hi the hydraulic handbrake. He had so much confidence in that car self. He knew it wasn't going to upset the balance. And look at this. Slow-mo shots from down on the circuit of Dwayne McKeever door to door with Laurie Heinen. Nowhere else in the world do you get this quality, Dave. And to get it at this speed, I mean, we're talking over 120 miles an hour sideways, which means your wheels are at 130, 40, 50. 50 miles an hour and you've set the car up like a drag car to go sideways that it doesn't want to do. These guys are driving past the grip. It's almost inhuman where drifting has gone. And now we're going to have to see someone go inhuman again because Laurie Heinen's got to do something incredibly special here. He's now had the radio on it and the spotter has told him, you got to go for it, Laurie. This is all on the line now. He certainly has got to go for it. He can't let McKeever get away. He needs to bring that chase A game right here, right now. He's gone wide though. He's lost himself. He's lost in the smoke. Is Laurie Heinen and he starts to fall and Heinen is nowhere to be found as Laurie Heinen is absolutely lost in a cloud of smoke from Dwayne McKeever as he heads to the wall and across the line. Is it done right there? Looks to me like that was the moment for Laurie Heinen. He went in, he gave it everything, but he got lost in the smoke. He had some understeer. I'm not sure what happened. We'll get a great view of it here on the replay. He's in the right zone, but does he push the front end of the car? He comes off throttle. All of a sudden, he's in the smoke. Look, he can't see where he is on the track. He loses ground. And then he realizes, oh, I'm in the wrong place altogether. And by the time he's realized that he's lost Dwayne McKeever. Yeah, he's absolutely lost him. And there is no way to gain it back. McKeever is so fast around this circuit that Laurie Heinen looked drop wheels, ended up on the curb, upsets the balance of the car, and he almost straightens there. He has to keep hold of it. Watch this as he comes through the smoke of McKeever. You see him pop through the smoke onto the grass. Boom. Way out of position, way off that qualifying line. And I think that is the nail in the coffin there for Laurie Heinen. Yeah, I think it's a little bit more of a of disparity between the both runs than the judges or, or we would have expected, but it goes to show that first corner deciding so much, and Laurie Heinen lost a lot of ground. McKeever making no errors on both of his runs, and now very much looking like the man to beat if he gets the result here, because he hasn't put a foot wrong, and you can see just Laurie Heinen, he was hand out trying to reach forward, but he can't get there. And uh, I think Laurie Heinen's probably going to know the result before we do here, along with Dwayne McKeever. The results will drop in. It's for a place in the final four, and it's Dwayne McKeever getting the win. Dwayne McKeever gets the win and goes through to the final four. I think he and Laurie would have known that at the end of that run that it was enough done from both sides. So there you have it. Laurie Heinen doesn't put a foot wrong all weekend and all of a sudden it's just one. One, one small foot error. One foot wrong yeah. on the initiation. We move it back to the start line. It will be Kevin uh, Pascur to take on Jakub Pushkonski. Pushkonski sits in that lead position. The Estonian driver now finds himself in a place where he hasn't found himself before here in the Driftmasters European Championship. And that's fighting for a place in the final four. He will be hungry for this one. But Jakub Pushkonski, a long time off the podium for him in European drifting. He will want this more than ever, Dave. I think both of these guys are going to want this because Kuba Pshkonski hasn't been on a podium in a while at Driftmasters and for a man of his talents and, and his many accolades, he wants a few more Drift trophies and that's why he's here looking so professional, looking so focused right now. But Kevin Pazor, we haven't been in this position before, Pshkonski has, a sea of experience weighs out. Well it should do, but will it though? The young gun fires from the smoke and he makes contact with Pshkonski and turns him around and parks his car on the grass. Yeah, that's, uh, that looked to me like it was just a little too much aggression from Kevin Pazor. Maybe he just wanted to say hello to that uh, cameraman that was out there, looked pretty lonely out there. He said, I might go ahead and say hello to him. It looked to me like that was too much aggression on entry. We're going to get a great view of it here. If Pishkonski enters, let's see if he slows or he just keeps going. Into the first corner they go. Pishkonski initiates. He's on throttle. And looks to Kevin just pushes that little bit too far. It's knife edge at that speed, though. It one is. one a, touch. Lot of, a lot of the drivers saying to me that um, if you're at that speed,
uh, fit for use on a second run. <laughs> you can see Pushkonski just says, well, that's not how I planned this one to go. No, I yeah, probably didn't know where he was there. There's so much smoke and dirt in the air. Um, and Kevin, uh, Kevin Pizor just pushing that little bit hard. But you can forgive him for it because he knows how good Jakub Pashonski is. He knows that he wants to get close and he got a little too close in my opinion. So there we go. Yeah, a little you conversation see, yeah, on the start line. chat with the start line, Marshall Martin and um, Jakub Pashonski probably on the radio to the spot are saying, is the car, yeah, look, he's, he's asking him, is the car good to go? Can I just go as I am? Is, is there any reason to go back to the pits? Look at that. That one-off car, blue carbon fibre that he had specially made for this car, damaged. It's a shame to see, Dave, but that's why they built these cars. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to clarify that for people, just so to break down what you said. So when we say blue carbon fibre, we don't mean carbon fibre wrapped in blue or painted blue. We mean blue, blue carbon, carbon fibre. Fiber. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, it took us a while to figure that one out. We didn't even know it was a thing. Now no. it's a thing. Oh, oh, here we go. We've got a puncture on Kevin Pizzora's car from the impact, which means that he will or won't be able to, can he reinflate it? He's got two minutes. I don't know if he's going to be able to do this. Uh, right, so we're going to get the clarification first. We're going to ask Kevin Pursuit, is that how low he was running those tire pressures? Because we've seen these guys before, a certain circus running them almost with no valves in the tires, just running them super, super low. Our safety marshal will be down there to have a look to see if that um, is the case, that he is running them this low. Is he rolling? I mean, running tire pressures that low seems a little bit sketchy to me. It is still beaded on the tire, so this is an interesting one because we do know, as you said, a lot of you guys might think, why are they running the tire pressure so low? Well, the reason being is that it makes the tire wider because it's yep. flatter. So you think about it, when you have a real low tire pressure, it's very soft, the tire has more uh, room on the ground. To, more to, contact more patch, contact Dave. Patch. That's that the, the word. Was that, that the word? Was exactly that was the was one. Yep. And now he's doing the international signals for, I'm not sure what I Oh, did. I think he's trying to now blame maybe Cuba for the contact. Yeah, there's a little bit of deliberation going on between our safety marshals and our technical advisors and Kevin Pizor and Kuba Pishkonski. And the judges probably getting a little information back as well of what happened on that first corner. Now, they'll obviously make an independent decision on this. But let's have another look at it. As they come into that first corner, Kevin Pizor reckons he was in the right. He initiated. To be fair, from Kevin Pizor's perspective, he's on the handbrake consistently all the way into that. So he hasn't gone on the throttle. He's only so we're going to be now looking. He's only deselling. Look, he's only deselling the whole way, and he has to come on the throttle to And here. there isn't any tire smoke from the back of Pushkonski's car from that wheel in that shot. Okay, so, so we're, we're, we're analyzing now... it. However, the judges were hearing it in our headsets. And they have allocated fault to Kuba Pushkonski. They've said that he, I'm sorry, to Kevin Pizor. They've said that he's come in too fast. He's come in too fast and he's slowing down dramatically because he's over-initiated at too much speed. So the judges have said that Kevin Pizor is on less angle. That's why he's picking up so much pace. Okay. And he's darting towards Kuba and therefore he hits Kuba. Therefore, his tire issue is caused by his own mistake. Not my words, Ian. Not your words, Words Dave. of the judges. We're just getting this information we're in our headsets. Getting, yeah, we're, get, we're, get, we're just relaying what we're hearing. Um, but to me, from my perspective, it did look on initial glance that it was an issue of Kevin Pessor hitting Kuba Pushkonski. We did see Kuba Pushkonski's tires light up. It is a very fast part of the track, so they don't just instantly smoke because no. they're obviously just fighting the grip. It looked like he initiated the same speed as he always has and done the same thing he's done in every other run. So Kevin Pessor may be thinking Kuba Pushkonski was going to be very fast, came in a little too hot, made contact. And if he's made contact, now at the point of reason is going to be he cannot continue if the safety marshal deems his tire pressure is too low to continue. Then they're deciding is it a tire pressure issue or a puncture issue. Now I'm also looking at it going, that would be the opposite side of the car. So has he picked that up when he's driving through all the gravel and the grass when he's going off the track? That's another thing to think about. A lot going on here, Ian. A lot going on, and I'm hearing it in my ears now that Kevin Pissarro is not allowed to run. Unfortunately, our safety marshal has deemed it unsafe for him to be able to run the car. Uh, he will be out of competition, Dave. That means that moving forward in competition will be Jakub Pushkonski. We do need to make it official. He does have to uh, leave the star chicane and initiate in that first corner, as we've seen yeah, before. Yeah, it looks to me like he picks up that puncture as he goes off the circuit, but the reason he's off the circuit is his own mistake. Well, I'm going to go to Kevin O'Connell quickly. Kevin, if you're there, what happened there? So it looked to me uh, straightforward at the start, but you guys had a little deliberation, but in the end, it was straightforward. 
yeah, look, we always make sure that we ch check all of our camera angles here to make sure there was no foul play or anything like that. But in our opinion, Kuba did exactly as he should have. He initiated absolutely fine and got back on power. Maybe he wasn't on full power right from the initiation point, but there was still smoke coming off of his wheels and there was no deceleration in our eyes. In our opinion, Kevin just came in far too hot, made big contact almost immediately after our initiation, and therefore he was at fault. There you go, and then it, he drives off the track, goes through all the rubble and the stones. He picks up some level of puncture, and I mean, remember that tire's already on low pressure, so it's not it's not made for off-road off-roading. And now Gubaskowski initiates into that first corner. He's going through to our final four. Drama in the top eight, but we love a bit of drama. We love it. We love it. We love it. It's good for the spectators, not for the drivers. That's what I always say about drama. But it's interesting to watch. It looks like Kuba. He has initiated, he's going to do a full run of the track and a free practice run here because awaiting him in the final four will be Dwayne McKeever. Yeah, Dwayne McKeever heads up against uh, Jakub Pruszkowski in that final four for a spot in the final. And, uh, well, drama after drama after drama. And we're not even done with our great eight no. because up next we have got uh, Naoki Nakamura to take on Benedictus Cherba. This is what I've been looking forward to because I have no idea what to expect from either of these guys because no. Cherba... As I said, you spin the wheel on the line, it's either the most amazing 100-point run or it's a sketchy one. Nakamura, I'm going to put him in the same category. Got better at the lead runs as the, as the day went on, but his chase runs, he can sometimes be a little overly aggressive. Yep. We're going to weigh those two up now, and we have no idea which way that one's going to go. And I think, you know what, we talked about Kuba Fischkonski, um, super consistent as a driver. He's a racing driver, he's a rally driver, he's a Dakar winner on four and two wheels. So what he's done there is just keep the same line going all the way through, and sometimes that's just enough. And Kuba gets the job done on the first corner and goes through to the final four there's your official decision and that to me is impressive because he's not really the the, the occasion never really gets to kuba because he's been in so many of these occasions before doing the nice smooth thing has got him this far will it get him past mckeever i don't think so he's going to have to go to an uncomfortable level there but we move it back to the line nakamura cherba who knows? I mean, really, who knows? I mean, you've got Benedict. I thought Fischer. you were going to make a big bold statement there. I, you thought I was going to come with something. <laughs> I thought you were going to come with something then. I am cleverer than to make a prediction <laughs> at this one. You've got the Japanese champion versus the Lithuanian champion in Sweden. That's what it's all about at Driftmasters. You got Naoki Nakamura in the chase position where he wants to be starting. I think this is where he'll prefer to yeah. be at the start. And you got Benedict Sherman going, oh, I could feel some bumps on this one because Nakamura goes close. Here we he are. certainly does. Here we go through the chicane, through the start line, down through the gears. They go. Nakamura on the back bumper. Benedict Sherman already tucks himself into the smoke. Sherman flying as always. And look at this from Nakamura as he in the smoke on the transition. Bumper to bumper. No messing around. Sherman on an absolute flyer of a wide line. But no shaking. From Nakamura at the moment as he shallows up the angle, gets on the handbrake, settles that car now, looks for the transition, back, bam, onto the door he goes, door to door, loses a little bit of ground as Cherber opens the throttle. As advertised. <laughs> Naoki Nakamura going very close, and I think that's an amazing lead run from Cherba as well. Nakamura threw everything at it. You could actually hear Nakamura running out of gear a little bit in that track. You could hear the rev limiter quite a bit. I think that car is just on the edge of spinning wheels at some parts of that track, and he's doing a good job of dealing with it, but it gives him a little bit of an advantage in the slower areas, and it gives him a disadvantage in the faster areas. Nakamura doing a good job of staying with Cherba, but Cherba missing that inner zone uh, does get the outer zone. There's some errors on both sides, I think, for both of these guys, but it's an exciting battle to watch because you've got Nakamura throwing the car at Cherba and Cherba on that rocket ship lead run. All you want from a top eight battle. The lead run from Cherba is absolutely astonishing because he's just coming alive. We spoke about it earlier, getting into that groove. I, I'm going to say it right now, he's in the groove. He's in the groove. He knows where it needs to be. Puts that car exactly on that qualifying line and he's comfortable now. Yeah. And that's it, dangerous. It was strange to me at the end with Nakamura just kind of like backed off a little bit through that last corner. You know, he was kind of really where he wanted to be here. And then all of a sudden kind of just doesn't have the legs or something to kind of keep it all the way. Or maybe Cherba comes off throttle a little bit. So a couple of errors creeping in on both sides, but I think this one's definitely going to come down to the second run. And Nakamura is putting in very good lead runs. And he's, you know, he, when he's set the pace, he's just as dangerous. But Cherba, I think, you know, Cherba about knowing him and spoke, spoken to him over many of the years he's he's going to be in fanboy mode here because he's a big Naka, <laughs> he's a big nakamura fan so he's going to be like imagine i beat the guy i've been watching for the last 10 years drive this is amazing moments for people like benedict does he's going i'm actually going to be chasing Naoka Nakamura right now. And it might even work. Here we go. Can we turn up in the chase position? Nakamura in the lead. Here we go. Top four space up for grabs. Who's going to take it? Well, who's going to take it indeed? Tire smoke already from 
Nakamura and he fires that car on a big angle, but it's no scare in Cherba as he gets closer The Nakamura as he looks for the back bumper. Side skirts, panels start to fly from Nakamura's car. He's on the handbrake for a long time in the outside zone that allows Cherba to set himself up now. Cherba losing some ground as Nakamura fires into that final outside zone and Benedictus Cherba having to shortcut the circuit. No proximity as they get it across the line. A strange second half of the run. Oh, there's going to be a lot of analytics in this one because there was mistakes everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, and it was a, it was a good run, but you can see it from, from this perspective. Nakamura kind of does a pretty okay first part of the course, but Cherba runs wide in the chase position, almost overshoots the corner. Watch this, he gets close. He's got to back off. Nakamura does collect those zones, but he's not in a huge amount of angle. Does get it. Now, watch this from Nakamura. Now, starts to pull the handbrake very early. And Cherba's not affected by this because he's way back. And it does allow Cherba back into the battle a little bit. But as they go through this section, now Cherba starts to cut the course quite dramatically. And so you've got a mistake from Nakamura maybe on the decel. And now, as Nakamura puts the foot down here, this is kind of spot on. But Cherba doesn't really have the proximity. And as they come to the last corner, this is where I expected Cherba's car to have the speed and dive through. He does but not quite as close as we would expect. And as Nakamura gets back on throttle, Cherb is still playing a little bit of catch-up. Interesting. No idea. No, no idea. idea. Yeah, I have no idea. No idea which way the judges will go on this one, because there's a lot. This is going to be one of those abacus moments where you're pushing it left and right of so many things over two runs. And it's going to come back to those briefings. It's going to come back to those technical decisions from the judges. And I don't know. And I'm, I'm supposed to be an expert here, but there were so many things in that battle that uh, my poor little brain can't calculate them as quick as the judges. I'm going to go all out there and just say lead to lead, very good. Yo, lead to lead, I don't think that's the question. But chase to chase, I'm going to say that Cherba made more mistakes in his chase than Nakamura did in his chase. Nakamura had more proximity. And he had more proximity, which we know from f battles previously today alone have been battles that allow drivers to progress further. I think where the judges are really, you know, being very strong on it, that this is a tough track to be close. So if you are yeah. close, you're rewarded heavily for exactly, it. Exactly, because it's a very fast track. It's an awkward kind of track of at times. It, to actually be very close in proximity is tough. Yeah, but if you're not close in proximity and you're still cutting the circuit and missing zones... You get punished. And we've seen it, Dave, already. So I am I wonder, could we be right again today? Yes. Could we? Yeah, we don't see two very happy men waiting for this decision. <laughs> they have no idea which way this one's going to go. They're not so sure. But we are going to get a decision. And going through to the final four will be... Nobody, because we're going to a one more time, one more time. Benedict Cherba is like, this is my 500th run today. I've been in so many one more times. But Nakamura and Cherba will go one more time. And one more time, we'll go back to Kevin O'Connell. Kevin, there was an awful lot going on there. We couldn't understand it. And then in the end, it's a one more time. Yeah, a huge amount to digest this digest there, Dave, but uh, realistically it all comes down to lead to lead versus chase to chase. Cherba, I think we could all agree, definitely had the cleaner lead uh, fulfilling that uh, qualifying line that we're looking for, whereas Nakamura definitely making some mistakes, a few wobbles and definitely cutting the line in some places, and he also had a major uh, long handbrake drag coming up to outer zone 4, as you'll just see here on the replay. Then you compare the chase to chase, uh, Nakamura had an absolutely fantastic start, one of the best first corners that we've seen all day uh, but then he fell massively off from outer zone four all the way until he made a big dive coming into outer zone eight whereas Cherba unfortunately just didn't bring much proximity there and um, it was like he was lacking a little bit of pace so overall Cherba wins the lead Nakamura wins the chase we have to see him go one more time that makes sense to me and because if we can't figure it out it's probably pretty close and it was close enough that we want to see them go one well we couldn't work it out so it, it was right that it went one more time but though we How can't we can't work much out so it's it doesn't no. say much anyway no. we're going back to the start line it is going to be another great eight battle between jack shanahan yuha rinton experience versus the young gun in shanahan who's been taking a lot of trophies over the last couple of years this is a big battle it's a huge battle. It's a huge battle because I'm going to say now that Jack Shanahan probably watched you hard written and drive like I did and probably like you did and many others that are watching right now in the grandstands and around the world watched you hard written and do his thing for many years, watched him become a great driver. And now Jack Shanahan sits along the line, aside him in the line and says, you're going home early. Well, here we go. Shanahan in the chase, Rinton in the lead. Big early initiation from Shanahan, risky from Shanahan, but he makes it work as you are Rinton now puts foot to floor, loads of pace in that G86, pulling away from Shannon massively on, on the D-cell here. Now Shannon's going to make a dive to this corner. Very good line. You are in the missing that inner zone, going a little bit too wide and barely taking the next zone. Rinton is on a flyer, but 
Shannon cannot catch it to the last section of this course. If they go through Shannon with no proximity, oh. Shannon's got a problem. Shannon shuts down. Something went wrong for Shannon in there. Something gave way big time on that last corner. I'm not sure what that was. I would love to see the replay of this one, Dave. I would love to see the replay, because Shanahan's car, it looked like it almost over-rotated in that final outside zone. Did he spin? He might have not been a, been a mechanical error. It, it, it could have been a driver error. It was almost like an over-rotation. Let's take a look back at this, though, as they come through the center circuit. Yuha Ridden's car, is it powered by rocket fuel? Because he is up and gone. Watch this, but watch Shanahan. He comes on the throttle in the outside zone. too fast and uh, our Starline Marshal just checking in to make sure everything is okay with Jack Shannon but Yuha Renton takes a massive advantage here and if I'm my, looking at my bracket sheet in front of me everything is kind of in the balance right now as Yuha Renton heads into the chase position Renton he's already taken down Diogo Correa he's already taken down Kevin um, to Timo Peltola, and now he's looking very strong against Jack Shannon. Could this be your new favorite for the event to take it all the way? He hasn't put a foot wrong. He hasn't scraped through any battles here. He, he, he has hasn't. won well. He, he's won well every single battle. And you know the most dangerous thing? In four weeks' time, we go to his hometown. And then he gets another boost. Here we go, off the line they go. Shanahan to lead out. You are written and written and looking to get this one done. Dusted Jack's going to try and drive away. Absolutely fires through. But will you are written and play it safe? Will he play it clean? As Shanahan drops a wheel off the edge of the circuit, forces that car into a transition. But look at written still not giving up as he gets himself into it. You are written and almost cutting the circuit there as he does now. Cuts the outside zone, trying to seal the deal on the transition. Jack Shanahan in into that final outside zone. You are written and onto the door across the line. So, yeah, we're hearing from the Starline Marshal that he asked Jack Shannon, was the car okay? And Jack said, I just messed up. I made a mistake. So, with that spin on the first run, I mean, you don't, it doesn't take uh, a genius to work out that Yuha Renton, what I will say is, watch this move from Yuha Renton. It looks like he's going to make a massive error. He's losing ground. He fires through Shannon. And you think at this point, he's covered in smoke again. He's going to make a see. big error. Can't yep. see. He still gets it done. He still stays. He's not making any unforced errors. Sure, didn't have a ton of proximity, but then you could forgive it because his spotter is probably saying, hey, you don't need to do anything here. Just get around the track. Jack Shannon spun behind you. Why do you need to go close? Why risk oh, it? Oh, he chucked it on the curb. We completely missed that in the smoke. You have ridden him when a wheel off the curb, over the curb. Oh, I see, yes. On that inside zone. Well, then he did take a bit more of a risk than he should have. But, but it's, not, it's, gonna, it's, it's gonna, not an incomplete. It's not an incomplete, and, and Shannon makes the biggest error here. He spins the car uh, in that outer zone. You can see Jack explain to you how Rente says, I, I spun, that's it. You can almost read the, the lips there as it goes. Uh, don't read too much with Jack Shannon. You never know what we might say. And Yuha Rinton will get the win. Yuha Rinton gets the win and goes through to the final four. The flying fin into the top four. Impressive stuff. Um, I'm, you know what, from my perspective right now, I'm telling you, this guy has put no, he says he's having fun out there, he's relaxed. How relaxed is everybody else? I'm not sure how relaxed they are. Not relaxed. Exactly, <laughs> and I think Yuha Rinton looks to me like the most, you look at the body language, you say, he's, he's just chilling, he's smiling, he's having fun, he's waving to everybody in the grandstand. He feels confident in the car and his ability. That's a dangerous man out there. Well, I'm just taking a look at who is in the final four so far, Dave, and yeah. Well, that's, a, that's as far as I want got, to go You've with got that. McKeever against Pishkovsky. Big battle. And we also have Yuha in there. But the man that won't be in there is Jack Shanahan. Becky's with him. An unforced error. Very strange from Jack Shanahan. Just not his day today, Becky. Absolutely not his day today. But Jack, I know this is not the result that you wanted. We watched the onboard there. You could see you were full on power and you just reached the lock stops there. An unnatural error from you. What was going on inside the car? Uh, I don't know. To be honest, with the way I'm driving this season, I think it is a natural error at the moment because the skill set has been left in the winter for some reason and I just can't get my head in the game and 
Yeah, it's disheartening because the amount of work we put in the winter and everything to try to get the car going, and it's like I rebuilt the car but left everything at home in the garage because if I keep driving like this, I'll be done by the end of the season, I think, because it's, it's, it's impossible to do this and have these kind of results. And, yeah, you have just a better man in the day. I'm just pissed off, but, yeah, here's what it is. So time to pack up and head home. <laughs> Jack, you're an incredible driver. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in Finland. Yeah, Jack Shire, I mean, he's a competitive guy. Not happy with the result there, Ian. And, and he, again, a guy used to the podium last year, and he's not getting an easy run of it. And we watch this happen in sport, not just drifting a lot of the time, where someone looks like the favorite, they come back. It takes them a while to get back into the, the groove of things. He hasn't changed the car or the chassis. He's, he said himself, just not getting into the groove this year. Two runs, he's still not miles away from the top of the championship. It's still a top eight finish. So, you know, I'm sure some guys that didn't qualify will be going, I think this is pretty okay, Jack. You know, it's not too bad. But uh, for Benedict Escherba and that Nakamura, there is glory ahead. A top four place for either Churba or Nakamura would be incredible. We have a Churba, but we don't have a Nakamura right now. So I'm wondering what's going on on that start line. Uh, is he warming up? Do we have that bright pink and blue S15 ready to go, or is there a problem? No, apparently he's leaving his pit garage any moment now. He does have, does have two minutes, Dave, once Churba pulls to the line to make his way down towards the start line. I can see him. I just looked at a cheeky look out the right window of the commentary booth, and I can see him making his way down the pit lane now. Look at this, you can see Dwayne McKeever all ready for action. Yeah, Dwayne is interesting. He, he doesn't like sitting in the pit area. Oh, it was uh, Jakob Pruszkonski actually making his way down. I thought that was... Uh, uh, yeah, we haven't, seen Naka Nakamura. we haven't seen Nakamura just yet, where he is or what's going on. But um, what I'm just saying is Dwayne McKeever, strangely, he, he sits on that pit area. He doesn't like going back to... to, to, to sorry, sits on the grid area. He doesn't like going back to the pits. He thinks maybe a little bit too much going on. Too many too, people. Too many people, too many opinions, a lot of talking. Stay in the zone, stay in the car, don't worry about it. And you know that if you're out in that grid, you're only with the people in the competition. It's all very calm. There's not a lot of hustle and bustle. And it is a big mind game here because you've got to stay um, as much as you can in the zone. And do we have a Nakamura? Right, Nakamura hasn't... Um, it isn't under the clock at the moment because Benedict Escherba hasn't pulled to the line, so he hasn't been requested to the line yet, Dave. Yes. So that clock will only be started uh, once he's requested to the line. That's my mistake, getting a bit ahead of the game here. I want to get this uh, final four I'm underway. Excited. Oh, I'm, I'm excited. Get, I'm excited for get, Nakamura get, and Cherba. I want to get this. I want to get, I want to find out who's going to be the final driver in the final four and then get that final four underway. Like you say, Dwayne versus Jakob. Who's it going to be taking on Juha Ritten and pff, look, you put your money on anyone at the beginning of the day. I, I tell you what, I had my bets hedged on Laurie Heinenham. Well, what I like about this is that it's shaping up that we will have four different nationalities in the top four, either way. Either way. So we've got an Irishman going up against a Polishman. We've got a Finnish driver in Yuha Rinton going up against either a Japanese man or a Lithuanian man. So there's a nice little mix of stuff. And you can see Yuha Rinton being allowed to uh, warm those front uh, tires Benedict of the car. Cherba. I'm sorry, Benedict Cherba, my mistake. I'm looking at the grid, not at the screen. <laughs> but uh, we have got an interesting ba couple of battles coming up again. I mean, this is unknown territory. I think if you look at all of these guys, McKeever's kind of been there before. He's got to the top uh, top two on this particular track last year. It seems to suit him pretty well. Pszczanski, we didn't get a whole lot of his hand on the table there when we had an incident on the first corner. And I mean, Cherba's been one more time in and one more time in and getting through. He's been scrappy. He's been battling. And I like it because I think he's got he's got a bit of, you know, he, he can push a little bit more if yeah. he needs to. I mean, is this going to be a helping hand for Cherba if he beats Nakamura and moves moves into the final four. Is this extra seat time, all these battles, all this driving going to help him? Is well, this going to be the key to get him onto the podium well, I, I told you that Cherba would be a big Nakamura fan, but he's gone one more time. With not him. now, he's, he's not. Started, <laughs> no, he's starting to become a bit of a believer. He's starting to think, I could take this guy. I can take him. I got one more time. I can go a little better than that. I can clean up my runs. Nakamura knows now that Cherba, he wouldn't even know who Cherba is probably before this, but now he does, and now he knows he's got to push on this one. He's going to know his name by the end of this weekend, that's for sure, as Cherba slots through the gears, fires that BMW into that initiation zone. But look at this from Nakamura. He's right onto him. You can barely see him through the smoke. Blows exchanged, and it forces Cherba off of that qualifying line, but he deals with it now as Nakamura takes a breath, thinks about it once again, looks for the transition. Cherba can't get away this time as Nakamura Nakamura fires through, takes an early transition, almost a mistake from Nakamura, but he squeezes the fold, jumps up onto the back bumper. That is absolute madness from Naoki Nakamura. Madness. I mean, they're at 120 miles an hour as if they're driving at 20 miles an hour. Nakamura on this first corner has been the best of anyone in this competition. Look how close. He definitely makes contact here, I'd imagine. He gets so close. And then on the transition, this is at 120 miles an hour, folks, right here. 
transitions. He perfectly. doesn't make contact. Doesn't make contact. Sherba is at fault there. Fucking yeah. off that qualifying line. Sherba making the error there. I thought it was Nakamura on first impression. Watch this. Watch how close he's going to get from the on ball. You can see Nakamura from the on ball, Dave. And Just I haven't think seen, about that. In any on board we've seen from this particular angle, we haven't seen a car there today. No. But there was Nakamura all the way through it. Right on. He goes, and look at that, way off the line, Cherba there. That's the bit that messes up Nakamura because it pushes Nakamura to an early transition, which puts him offline and allows Cherba to get the run. But then there's a little error from Nakamura here. He stays too late in it here. Watch, he stays too late, too early, and then he has to kind of break one direction this way and then go this direction. Not a massive error, but it's enough. Um, yeah, again, we're back where we started. Not sure, but Nakamura definitely turning up the pressure. Whoa. Yeah, he's definitely turned another pressure. Look at this. The way he makes those dives onto the door is just incredible. He's very, he's very exciting. He's very <laughs> exciting to watch. I will say that. And a, and a great addition to the championship. Yeah, Cherba deals with it. But Cherba, that line to the outside zone, that's going to be a big point deducted from the judges. Well, here we go. They swapped him around. Nakamura now to lead out Benedictus Cherba. Another roll of the dice for both these guys. Thumbs up. He's getting involved in it, Dave. He's having fun now. He's very relaxed for a man that's doing 120 mile an hour dives like he is. <laughs> I absolutely love it. He's now in the lead position. It was sketchy enough for the lead position on the last turn. Cherba's got to turn it off here. Cherba's got to go for it. Cherba has to go for it. He has to put himself in an uncomfortable position, and it looks like he is going to go for it. They fire through, but look at this already. Nakamura starts to pull through. Cherba goes wide. Oh, Nakamura gets understeer. They both get understeer. Pass through. Nakamura deals with it better than Cherba. Cherba starts to get himself back into the swing of things now, but it's already allowed big separation to open up for Nakamura. And Nakamura fires into that final outside zone. Cherba ground loss, not sure what way the judges are going to see this one. No, I'd love that one to be simple, but I'm going to tell you why I don't think it is simple. I'm not sure if Nakamura lifts throttle through that first corner to just lift a little bit and gets that understeer. Um, Cherba catches at a, a rate of pace, and I'm wondering, is he on full throttle, Nakamura, at that point? Now, Cherba goes wide, Nakamura makes a massive error here. The car, watch this, he's on full throttle. He comes off, the smoke cloud yep. clears, Cherba gets closer. Cherba has to kind of back off a little bit. Now when Nakamura transitions, he's kind of in no man's land. And then... He... I think that I think that error was on false, Dave. Yeah. I'm going to throw it all out there. I've thrown a lot Cherba's of comments just... out. I think, I think, I think Benedictus Cherba just gets himself lost in the smoke, catches a bit of understeer. Watch this. It winds the steering yeah. back. I think this yeah. is an unforced error. <laughs> Watch this. I, I understand where you're coming from on that standpoint of view. And like he's off throttle. He's not, he's not at sideways here, Nakamura. He's, oh, kind, of driving, know, he's kind of driving through that section. From that angle, it makes it look way worse yeah. for Benedictus Sherba. I think we have two unforced errors there. You think I, they both I, I, I think they, understand? I think they both made a mistake there. And then it's going to come down to, I don't know what it's going to come down to, but for me, look at Nakamura. He's sideways. He's off throttle. There's no smoke, but a little bit of smoke. And then all of a sudden drives straight pretty much straight and then reinitiates again. But Sherba's already driving straight at the same time, so I don't know what's going on there. But does it affect Sherba? He's kind of too far back for it to affect him. And from, the, from, the, from one of those angles, you can't really see it. It was from the opposite angle, possibly the drone. You could see how far the, the separation was. I have no idea. The thing is, it's so much going on in one, one split second. So you've got the yeah. lead car and the chase car making big errors. I'm going to kind of wipe the rest of the course clean and say, I don't think it's going to come down to that. No, not at all. It's going to come down to that first corner. And if you're at home or you're here in the grandstands, just have a little talk. Talk amongst yourselves, what do you think? Nakamura, straight, Cherba, understeer and straight. Was one caused by the other? We're both on forced errors. Are we going to all go down to the chase run of Nakamura? We don't know. We don't know what way it's going to go, but it's not easy. And it's not going to be easy for either of these guys because they know they've both made mistakes, but someone's going to go through to the final four. There has to be a decision one way or the other. And I would not like to be Kevin, Vernon, and David trying to make this decision on that one because they've looked at all the angles, they've looked at the onboards. There's a lot going on, and I can't wait to hear the explanation at the end of this one because either way, whether it goes for Nakamura or, Ch or Cherba, it's going to have to be explained because there's a lot going on for our simple brains to understand, Ian, especially you and I. But here it is. The decision is dropping in. Who is going through to the final four? It's going to be Noki Nakamura gets the win. Noki Nakamura gets the win and goes through to the final four. The dream is alive for Nakamura. But um, Kevin, you're having a handy day today. Not much to think about. That was an easy one, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely simple, completely straightforward. Look, it, realistically, it all comes down to the second run where, where there was an incomplete, um, and we had to deem that incomplete. But just to go back to the first run there where we initially thought that there was contact uh, between the two drivers, uh, Chirba and the lead run, uh, we checked our drone footage, and there actually was no uh, contact at all. That was an unforced error on Chirba's part. You'll actually see it here from the drone shot. There, it looks like Naoki comes in a little bit too much, too tight.
late, but uh, there is no contact there, as you can see. Uh, then to, to go back to the second run there, though, where there was an incomplete. In our opinion, it was an unforced error. You could see Chirba was way offline already. He was completely missing in our clip two, and I think he got caught in the smoke. Um, yes, Naoki would have been heavily deducted for that, but Chirba had opposite drift, therefore an incomplete had to be scored. We didn't think uh, Nakamura had done enough to cause that incomplete by Chirba, so therefore Nakamura gets the win. Well, we made much more hard work at the side than that Kevin and the boys did. <laughs> we did, yeah. To yeah, be fair, we that went... That makes perfect sense. We went round the track 50 times yeah. and got to the same decision. We would, ne we would never get out of a maze, that's for sure. <laughs> right, guys, well, there it is. We are now got McKeever versus Pshigonski, Nakamura versus uh, Yuha Rintanen. If it's exciting up to here, it's about to get even more exciting as we now head to the top four. We started with 51 drivers. We are now down to four. They represent Ireland, Poland, Japan, and Finland. But only one is going to take home top step on the podium, and it starts right now. Dwayne McKeever looking unbeatable all day today. He finished second here last year. He will equal that result with a win or better if he gets through this battle. But Pishkonski has taken all the punches from everyone who's hit him along the way, and he's still standing up fighting. Huge top four battle ahead of us as Polish Dakar Willer, Rally Willer, and champion goes up against UK and Irish champion Dwayne McKeever. Here we go. Here we go through the chicane, through the gears. Look at this. McKeever on the back bumper of that GR86 as they fire through. And look at this, Pushkonski already putting a little bit of ground between himself and the Irishman as Pushkonski's on a not a good qualifying line. But this is the outside zone and that upsets the line from McKeever. He has to reassert himself, has to think about where he is on the circuit. Now McKeever back into the flow of things, back onto the throttle he goes, looks for the side of that GR86 and he finds it, but his wheel's over from McKeever across the line. Oh. If you thought it was exciting now, it's definitely getting more exciting because you have got wheels over, you've got contact, you've got off-qualifying runs. Let me break it down for you, people. Pishkonski, this is where it gets a little bit sketchy for him. On the first corner, he's getting that inside zone missed, and then he straightens up a little bit. It does get nowhere near that zone, and McKeever's pinned to the other side of the track. So the judges are going to look at that lead run and say, Kubat, that's not where you're supposed to be. So at that point, you're looking, oh, Dwayne McKeever's got a big advantage here. All he's got to do is keep his nose clean and get close as he can. Pishkonski now starts to tidy it up. Does a really good job of getting through the course. You can see him pushing to the edge of the circuit here. McKeever then dives into that last corner. And this is where he maybe dives a little bit too hard. He comes in onto the rear quarter panel of that GR86. And as they transition back, McKeever makes a big transition. He comes out of the smoke and you can see the front wheel lock thinking, I'm way too close. I'm going to make contact. Touches the back of the car, drops a wheel over the edge of the circuit, but does stay in it. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. No right. words. There's no, no words, words. because watch this. He's going to make contact here, and he has to I, I think slam you're being the generous front brake. saying one wheel, Dave. I'm going to go all out on a limb here and say that was two wheels at one portion of the circuit. I'm not so sure. I think one, one wheel for me, but again, I still think, you know, if it was yesterday, qualifying, the judges said two wheels off is a zero. Now they're saying it's a big deduction. It's a big deduction, yeah. I'm thinking if you look at the deduction that Pushkonski's building I think from that bad qualifying run up to that maybe outer zone three or four, yep. I think it's kind of balancing it out. So yep. maybe this one is just dead down the even at that point. We've got great proximity from McKeever, but we got, you know, some errors in the lead from Pushkonski. Does it balance out? We don't know. We never know. That's but where I sit. That's I sit balanced out. I think these go Are into this. Are you sitting up there on the fence, Ian? No, I think these go into this battle now. Even? Even. Okay. I think this is all going to come down to the second half of the run. The the lead line from Pushkonski wasn't the greatest. We see that on the outside zone. The wheels drop from McKeever makes it even. I think they go into this half of the battle, Dave, both with everything to win. And I think the tale is going to be, can Pushkonski catch McKeever? Ah, that, you took the words out of my mouth. Sorry, I'll give them back later on. But right now, <laughs> it means that I think the fastest man around this circuit is Dwayne McKeever, and you are rinting it for me. And I think McKeever's going to put the pedal to the metal here and say, can I leave him there? That's what Pushkonski's got to watch. I want to know if Pushkonski can take a risk. Can he go outside the comfort zone? Can he put that car into a place where he hasn't put before? Well, we're going to find out now as we see McKeever absolutely fire car in and Pushkonski does. He takes the risk. He starts to put the car in a place where he hasn't put it before. He wants to be uncomfortable. He wants to find the side of that S13 as they come round in front of the grandstand and he loses the ground to one of the fastest men on the circuit right now as McKeever absolutely drives away from the Polishman. But he regains the ground offline. Up onto the door he goes. Well, almost like we predicted it. Almost, yep. McKeever Which
which is what he did around the circuit. Now, sure, he comes through the smoke cloud here. He cuts the circuit to get back to bottom. McKeever having a tough time actually anchoring the car to get around that corner, which he had an issue with in the other way around in his chase position. So it's going to come down to a couple of those factors. Yes, we're going to give McKeever the advantage for sheer pace on that second half of the run. But on the first half, does Kuba's mistakes in the lead balance out McKeever's mistakes in the chase, meaning, you know, add it all up, McKeever gets the advantage. But that's not the way it may be. It may be that way. Let's see what happens. Going to the final is... It's Dwayne McKeever goes to the final. He goes to the final. And uh, you know what, Kevin? We were just discussing that before the decision. It sort of said to us, Kuba has a bit of a mistake in his lead. Dwayne has a mistake, but there's no denying the lack of proximity on the, on the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely does come down to mistakes, really. You look at Dwayne's lead, uh, comparing lead to lead for both of them, I guess. You look at Dwayne's, it was very, very clean. A couple of very small uh, errors here and there, but that when you compare it to Kuba's, uh, Kuba was missing zones, and he definitely wasn't on that qualifying line. He didn't give Dwayne every opportunity to chase, just like Dwayne gave to him. You look at the chase runs then, Dwayne had some fantastic proximity in places, really nailing it to the door, um, even though he didn't have the ideal line to chase. Just one note on it, we did look at it. Dwayne put one wheel off on outer zone eight, not two uh, from our alternative views there. Um, he So that was a deduction, but overall, Dwayne, the cleaner driver over the two runs. We were just watching that replay, Kevin. It was, <laughs> it was one tire holding on for dear life, I think, on that outside zone. Um, but it is going to be Dwayne McKeever moving through to the final for two years in a row. Uh, he lost out in the final the last time. He'd love to rectify that result this time around. And we will see Kuba Pishkonski into the third and fourth place playoff. And now we're going to see Nakamura versus Rintanen. What a world where we live in. Where we're going to see two heavyweights of European and Japanese drifting go head to head for a spot in the final. This is what it's all about. Here. It certainly is what it's all about as we watch these two guys pull on the tyres at the back end of the circuit now. We start to get an idea of where this podium is going to lie. And, well, we are definitely going to have a different podium than we did at round one, that's for that's sure. For sure. And I think this is the thing. So whether you know you lose or win this final four battle, you get two shots at the podium. Yep. So if you win, you go to the final. If you lose, you go to the playoff, you get another shot at the podium. So there's a little bit of weight that comes off the shoulders of the drivers at that point, knowing they've got, you know, if they make one mistake, it's not quite over for the weekend just yet. However, Nakamura from Japan going up against Finland's Yuha Rintanen. These are moments that you will only see in Drift Masters and moments that you've probably discussed amongst your friends if you're a Drift fan for years and years. I wonder, fantasy battles. Fantasy battles. I wonder what's going to happen if this happened. Imagine if this happened and that happened. People have only seen things like this on the virtual world where people are replicating this stuff happening and it doesn't seem real but now it's really happening we have the Japanese champion against the Finland champion an ex-European champion in Yuha Rinten and he is super fast right now I think Rinten and looking stronger but Nakamura can you ever count him out you don't know what he's going to do he's the total unknown entity here and he could just go in here and be unbelievable or he could smash the two of them off the track or he could just you don't know and that's the beauty of Nakamura I love him and you just don't know what he's going to do you just don't know you have no idea you can't take your eyes off him because no. he, he just brings that aggression every time there's no backing down. Rinton is the opposite. Cool, calm, collected. Do my thing. Let's see how those stars mix up as we go for another spot in the final. Rinton is a lead in Nakamura. Yeah, look at this already. Nakamura's getting into the groove now. We talk about the groove and he's right in it. He's right in the pocket. He's right on the door as they come round the outside zone, hustling and bustling. Oh, but Nakamura takes a wrong transition. Wheels on the inside now and that allows you are Rinton to drive away. He goes in front of the grandstand on full front as he now hammers down towards that final outside zone. Nakamura gets himself back up into the pocket, back into the groove on that qualifying line, but it's too much too late. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to Kevin and, and his briefings that he said that they were deducting heavily for two wheels over the white line, but two wheels on the grass was a zero. So to me, very much two wheels on the grass from Nakamura there. That's just my initial thoughts. He gets way too... He's just incredible. Look at this. Oh, it's contact. Hits the front wheel. That shakes Nakamura's car. I didn't see that the first time around. He makes contact and he initiates in the smoke. So he has no idea where he's initiating. And all of a sudden, he's off the circuit, firing through the gravel. And at that point, it looks to me like those two front wheels were off the circuit. Yeah, it certainly was, Dave. All four were past the white line, if my eyes didn't deceive me there. And that contact, couldn't see it from that angle. Look how fast Rittenden's going. The bumper can barely handle the speed. Told you. You are Rintanen, getting about his business. Well, it looks like we could have two of the fastest men around this circuit going head-to-head. 
I think the track's going to start turning the other way if we ended up with a McKeever into the final. I think the track's going to unravel <laughs> like, like a cheap carpet. It's just going to start. Just, there's that much speed. But again, if you, if you talk about speed, it's not just about speed. I mean, Rintanen's not making errors. He's no. doing the perfect qualifying line. Nakamura, that's a totally unforced error for me. He goes too close, makes contact, goes off the track. And yes, it's tough to hang with that GR86, and it is very fast. But Rintanen is, is playing a game here of I'm not going to lose. You'll have to beat me, but I'm not going to lose on my own. And that's a very clever way of playing this whole bracket. If, uh, it certainly is. Um, it certainly is. Uh, uh, you know, the game he's playing at the moment, he's calculated, Dave. That's what I'm going to put it down to. He's being very calculated. So there we go. Uh, Dave's good friend Johnny Sweeps out there now. Yeah, Johnny the Sweeps, he'll make light work of this. Yeah. No problem to Johnny Sweeps. He's ready for this. And again, if he's, he's almost, the driving's been so good that we haven't seen much of Johnny Sweeps or Johnny Scoops this weekend no. because that's how good our drivers are. But it's nice to see a little cameo every now and again. A little cameo, Freddy, a little uh, appearance. Yeah, got to have a Volvo in Sweden at the track at some point. And it wasn't going to be our 900 horsepower car from yesterday. It may no. as well be this. This one's probably even a bit more useful because <laughs> it can work on a Monday too. So we have got a little bit of a cleanup on the track. And uh, that is going to be all of that gravel that was brought in from uh, Naoki Nakamura. And Nakamura, I think he just got a little bit lost. I don't know if he knew where he was on the track. And when he transitioned through the smoke, I, didn't know, I don't think he expected the curb to be on the other side no. of that. And then all of a sudden, he's like, nope, that's not where I want to be. And he went straight through. And to be fair, he went absolutely off the track four wheels where we've never seen anyone go off. And he still finished the run. He still got through he, it. Yeah, I mean, so he didn't he was, give up on it. He still had some form of proximity by the end of the run as well. <laughs> it's incredible. So uh, we're watching some interesting things happen. And we, as we mentioned before, we have got Dwayne McKeever into the final. There will be an Irishman in the final. We've got a Polishman into the playoff in Kuba Pyskonski. And now it looks to me like Juha Rinton, the Finnish driver, who has a lot of Finnish fans and support here in the grandstands. He is looking very, very on form right now to go to that final. He just has to not make any errors. And if I'm not mistaken, Nakamura is in the lead position, so he can't really force too much from there. No, he can't really force an error, really, from the lead position, Dave. And he kind of made all those mistakes on his own, uh, just over-aggressive. Uh, and, and you know what? He'll be kicking himself now. He'll be sitting in the car now knowing what he did wrong. Well, you know what? Either way for Nakamura at this point, think about it. He loses this battle to Rinton, and Rinton goes to the final. But Nakamura will still get a shot at Kuba Pishkonski, um in that playoff. And if, for example, Nakamura was to get third, to from where he went to Mandela with an engine failure, barely making it to qualifying, all the way to third in one round, look at that progression across two rounds for Nakamura. And I don't think this track really suits his uh, style at all. Just going to cover that. I was just going to mention what you were just about to mention. We had this discussion earlier on in the break between top, six, top 32 and top 16. I said, wait till we get to Finland, because I believe that Finland and Feropolis are two tracks where Naoki Nakamura will really come alive especially Finland. It's somewhere where he can express his flair. We've had a little preview of the track. Some of the other drivers uh, showed us a little video of what it's like, the layout. And I feel that's the kind of track that Naoki Nakamura will come alive. And if you were to talk about two drivers that you would probably associate with the word speed or the word fast, you would probably say Dwayne McKeever and Yuha Rinton. Yep. Those would be two drivers you'd say, oh, they like to go fast. Like Ricky Bobby, <laughs> they, they, they want to go fast. But now that's shown that they are very comfortable on these fast circuits, yeah. you know? And, that, and their cars are fast, their driving style is fast. And it doesn't always work on every circuit. No. You know, when you go to other, or you look at Poland at the end of the year, quite a technical circuit. You look at Ireland, it's a kind of fast in, slow for the rest of it. You look at sort of, uh, as you said, Finland and Germany, not super fast tracks. Riga is a super fast track. Yep. So there's all these different tracks thrown in, they're not all the same, which means that different drivers will shine at different points. And we will see Nakamura comfortable on big flick, big entry, big angle. That's not this track. So he's done really well against almost his sort of technical or his, his uh, characteristical style to get this far in this competition and now he's you know he's in a position where but then again it's drifting so uh, you know <laughs> he knows. we're calling it like he's lost awesome. you just never know here we go it's the second half of the battle to decide who goes to the final it will be Nakamura in the lead position and Rinton in the chase there we go Nakamura and uh, has to get out of it get back on it again but that forces you are running into a bit of understeer now. The bonnet flapping the speed. These guys are carrying understeer once again for Nakamura. I wonder if that car's damaged, but you are written on the inside of the circuit, going over the curve, missing clipping points. This one is a scrappy second off the belt. You are written, fires in, tries to find some sort of proximity at the end of the run, but I have no idea. Yeah, and I think it's going to come down to that first run with Nakamura off the track, because if it was down to the second run, I'm not sure which way the judges would go. We had mistakes from both. To me, it looks like the lead run at times becomes a little unchaseable. It looks to me like Nakamura is making errors, and, and you know, Rintanen goes 
Very, very close to two wheels off on the grass there as well. Very close. But he does it again as well on this transition. Watch this, they come down. They get that outside zone, they transition, and you can see Yuha Ritten and Nakamura's on, on a bad line, but he handbrakes a lot. But watch this, Yuha Ritten goes for the dive, doesn't work. Look at the angle, he goes way off line, two wheels, three wheels over the white line on the grass. Yeah, but Nakamura's on a weird decel there for a very, very long time. Does that force Rinton on the inside of the track? That's the question I would have. And it, it, he completely avoids that inside zone, granted. But, but is, the, is the fault of Yuha Ritten worse? I think that Nakamura's Overuse of deceleration there has caused Rinton to go on the inside of the track. That's my opinion. Counts for absolutely nothing, nothing. Ian, as you no. know. Doesn't even count to any other person but me. No. But to me, it looked like there was a lot of wavering from Nakamura on the way down to that second corner, and Rinton was not really able to get in the groove. Now, did that warrant him going completely two wheels off the track, or is it more cut and dry? Did he go two wheels off the track? Is the curb off the track? I don't know. <laughs> But the judges will decide that. It's the but track off the Either track. way, the drama continues. We have no idea. The boys with the brooms are having more action on the track than the drivers right now as there's gravel everywhere. I'm not sure. I'm not sure at all. The judges will make a call on this one, and I think it's going to need a little explanation from them as well because I don't know if this is as cut and dry as everybody thinks well, it is. Well, look at this. The Nakamura's team getting tyres ready, so I wonder if they oh, think so they, they might, might have they, they might have a look at this and say, maybe this could be one more time. Well, maybe they're preparing for the third and fourth place playoff. I have no idea. Usually we're pretty good at this, but to be honest, there's been so many interesting occasions today. Let's see which way it goes. It's for a spot in the final, and it's going to be Yuha Rinton and getting the win. Yuha Rinton and gets the win and goes through to the final of round two of the Driftmasters European Championship. Um, Kevin, you know what? I agree. I think to me it looked like maybe we were swinging back towards two wheels off the track from Rinton, and, but was it Nakamura causing those incidents? Yeah, Dave, you're on the ball. That, that was definitely caused by Nakamura. Um, very, very poor and uh, uncharacteristic uh, lead line from Nakamura there. Way off the qualifying line, and we were even borderlining on it being a completely unchaseable lead run. Uh, not adhering to the deceleration zones, way off line, missing the majority eclipse. Uh, Yuha did a very good job to even chase it in any way, shape, or form, to be honest with you. So we weren't sure if it was an incomplete or not, but realistically, it doesn't matter too much. It all comes down to that first run where there was a two wheels off by Nakamura anyway and uh, he definitely didn't overturn that in the second battle. Thanks Kev, well we're down with it and an elated Becky, he must be elated, he's just taken down one of the biggest names in the game to go to the final. Here in Sweden it's Juha Rinton, the man that can't seem to be stopped today. Absolutely Dave, he is the man that doesn't seem to be able to be stopped and I just said to him, Juha, that was a bit of a sketchy run there, what was that lead line to chase like? It looked fun. Uh, yeah, chasing Naoki, it was uh, pretty sketchy, like he did a few mistakes and on this track if you make mistakes on the first corners, it's very hard to follow and, and try to keep up. We saw on that first corner there, it looked like you got, almost got lost in the smoke for a second, is that what happened? Yeah, at least in the second corner, like you know, just blinded by the smoke many seconds. And you just have to hope that he's not in the way. And, Talk to me about what it is like as a driver when you get caught in that smoke. You must almost just have to transition the car and hope for the best. Exactly, you said it pretty well. <laughs> it's only happened to me once and I just felt like I was about to fly off track. So I, I think you're all are very brave, especially when you're carrying the speed that you are. Do you have any idea how fast you were going coming into that first corner? I'm not sure. Uh, at some point we have maybe 150 kilometers, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. The speed makes it sketchy in the smoke. How are you finding this car this year? You, re you seem to be really dialed in it. Are you enjoying it a lot more than your previous car? I do, and actually it's a bit calmer, calmer to drive than the S15, to my opinion. And uh, yeah, I like it. We're still dialing it in and everything looks going so well. So we'll see what happens. Yuha, it looks to be working for you so far. Good luck in your final battle. Well, there you go. Dialing it in as he goes round by round. Yuha Ritten finds himself in the final with a car that he's still learning and still adjusting every single run of the circuit and every single event that we go to. And there we go. We can see scenes down in the pits there of uh, uh, Naoki Nakamura's car getting some new fresh tyres on the back of it, ready for the third and fourth place playoff against Jakob Prashkonski. Uh, we'll get that one underway. As soon as we know these cars are going to be back up on the back end of the grid, Jakob Prashkonski already made his way down there, ready for action. 
And Naoki Nakamura, probably at the beginning of this weekend, and probably a few weeks ago when he was in Ireland, didn't think he'd be in this situation after suffering a terminal engine failure. But the team worked super hard, got him back out, and now looking stronger than ever and showing the form that he has as a Japanese champion. Dave, you are written, and I just want to go back to that, dialing the car in. I'm just going to go back to the fact that before top 32, I made a prediction about Yuha Rinsen. You did make a prediction. And I said, he's the one no one's talking about. Because if you watch all these big names and these big guys out there, and you're always watching them. I just today, it seemed like there was some inspirational moments from him where he wasn't making errors when everyone else was. He didn't look uncomfortable. And when you see, you know, your Jack Shannons, your, your Vyansex and your Cherbas making mistakes, making errors, and you start to see Rinsen not making any errors. You start to believe, and I saw that in practice. Like everyone in practice, everyone in qualifying, smooth. It seemed like he had the car dialed, the right gearing, everything was. And even when people were making mistakes in front of him, it was how he was dealing with them. For me, that was a big one. But before we get to that final between him and Dwayne McKeever, which I absolutely cannot wait because there's definitely no issue with pace on either car. They're no. going to be very well matched, which is a phenomenal way to finish this uh, incredible event. Now we get this total unknown between Pishkonski and Nakamura. And both have had very big issues in the lead position. They've been making waivers from the first to the second corner. And they're going to have to tidy that up here. And that's really kind of the, the issue that Nakamura had there. He couldn't seem to get the car around that first corner without having to straighten up or make some errors. And same with Pishkonski. So interesting. I think we're in for There's another twist in the tail here for me, especially with this one. And Pishkonski hasn't been on the podium in Driftmasters for quite some time. And Nakamura's never been on the podium in Driftmasters. But he's on the podium everywhere else. So this is going to be very interesting right now and I think Pishkonski and Nakamura are going to be thinking about this one going well if I take a third place trophy home this weekend that's a big win that's a big progression for me oh, it was a big statement Dave mm -hmm. as well it's a big statement as we move through the championship mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, a point that everyone's going to look at saying they have still got it or they are still in the fight for it the car is ready to rock and roll you can see uh, Nakamura, Nakamura now making his way back up to the start line he's going to warm up the tires on the back well, I mean, I'm going to put it this way. There's absolutely no way you can predict what's going to happen here because you've watched this event and you've gone, none of these guys, I mean, this is two of the best motorsport drivers out there. But they haven't looked at their best all the way through. And then it's hard to say that when they're playing off a third on the podium. <laughs> so it goes to show that this track is actually the divider, yeah. not, not the driving. It's the track. The track is difficult. It's unnatural. You've got super fast corners with really weird technical bits that are off the racing line. And you might say, well, why put a track on the calendar like this? Well, this is the reason, because you're testing these guys. I'm not putting easy tracks out there just left and right because these guys can do that all day. What they need to be is challenged, that they are being challenged by this layout. And you see some of the best in the business struggling here. You know that not only is the level of driving high, but the difficulty level is super high. And that's what Drift Masters brings to these guys that normally make these tracks, or tracks in general, look very easy. They're actually struggling because these are unnatural layouts. You look at Mondello, super fast initiation to very technical, slow second part of the track. Similar here in Sweden, which means that it's just a very tough thing to be consistent on every run. Nakamura hasn't, Pishkonski hasn't, but now they've got to, you know, clean it up, do the best two runs they can to get a trophy and a very well-deserved trophy. When you look at the level of drivers that have failed and, and dropped out of the competition, this is a big moment for both of these guys and a big moment for their championship campaign as well. Lots of points on the line here between third and fourth place and Nakamura and Pishkonski are going to know that. We've never seen a Dakar winner go up against one of the most stylish, most stylish guys in drifting ever. This is what's happening in Drift Masters right now. It's happening right in front of us. Here we go. Yeah, this is it. The third and fourth place playoff underway. Ready to rock and roll. And look at Nakamura. Nakamura onto the door of that GR86. You can't even see him through the smoke. He's closer than he's been all day. And it's a nice line from Brzkonski as he fires down. But look at Nakamura as he gets up into the groove. Oh, over the curb. He goes. He just about holds on to it. He shallows up the angle. He deals with it. And now he transitions back bravely once again onto the door, onto the wheel he goes. Wow! Well, there you have it. There's the highlight reel. Unbelievable stuff from Nakamura and from Pushkonsky. That is the best lead run Pushkonsky has gone, but talk about that chase. It was depth defying. It was unbelievable, Dave. Watch this, you can't even see him from the smoke. He gets closer than anybody else we've seen through most of these corners, and he stays there consistently. The proximity is insane. Not the best lead line from Pushkonsky. He doesn't get all the way out to the outside zone, but he deals with it, and he deals with it so, so well. Nakamura absolutely in there, and you can see how deep he had to take a bite at that inside zone to make sure he didn't lose Pushkonski. Now hold on, take a breath, stand back and watch this transition this from Nakamura. Transition.
Boom. That's what it's all about. That is Naoki wow. Nakamura all over. And on oh. the front wheel, touches the door across the line. That is as good as it gets. That is phenomenal, Dave. Phenomenal. Well, we promised you an incredible round. Look I at this. Look at this from this angle. Oh, flexing the carbon door of Pishkonski's car as Nakamura doesn't back out, stays in it, and then pushes Pishkonski right up along that wall. And as you can see, Pishkonski's going to have to do a lot of work in that chase position from here. This might be the most stress and pressure Pishkonski's ever been under to perform in the chase position. Yeah, no doubt. No well, doubt whatsoever. I, I just I, I have no words. I, I don't know if Pushkonsky can go to that place. He's been so reserved. He's so calculated. Again, we say it a lot, these drivers, him, Yuha Rinden, and they're calculated drivers. They work out what they need to do, and they do it so well. They execute it perfectly. I don't know if Pushkonsky could go that calculated. Could he go past being calculated no. and take the risk? I'll put it this way. Calculated means nothing now. Because he needs what to take a risk. What Naoki Nakamura has done there has gone beyond the realm of possibility on this track. We've never seen anyone go that close before and pull it off. So Pushkonsky, a good run here is going to lose him the battle. That's it. That's as simple as it is. If I'm his spotter, I'm saying a good run means nothing here. You nope. might as well just go and try and smash into it because that's what he did and it worked. He's over the edge here, so you've got to be over the edge as well. Pishkonski's got to go from it from the very first moment here. Well, he's getting left already, though, but he takes a late initiation and that's not going to work right against this man right now. And Noki Nakamura is super wide, but he holds onto it, shallows up the angle now, begins to drive away. And Pishkonski has nothing in this one. Shallows up the angle, tries to find the grip and the pace, but look at Nakamura. He is absolutely gone. He fires into that final outside zone and Pushkonski has no answer for the Japanese champion as he takes it home. Ladies and gentlemen, Naoki Nakamura is here in European <laughs> drifting. He is back in business. And after a tough first round of two engine failures, well, he comes to Sweden on a track that wouldn't normally suit his style, and he still puts on a display like that. Pushkonski had no answer throughout the course. And you know what? For some reason, the pace of Nakamura's car there was turned up another couple of notches very fast. Pushkonski's like, what do you want me to do? I'm cutting the track. I'm trying everything I can. I still can't catch him. And Nakamura puts on, and I mean, it wasn't perfect in the lead run. There was some moments, but it didn't matter because he wasn't affecting Pushkonski because Pushkonski was 45 miles behind, so it didn't make any difference. So Nakamura, clean lead, doesn't affect the chase car. And now with a phenomenal chase run, I think this may be the announcement onto European stage for this man who will be taking headlines, I'm sure, for the rest of this season. But he's shown, you know, a lot of people saying, did he live up to the hype? Would he live up to the hype? Well, I think we're going to get the answer to that very quickly. As taking third step on the podium is Naoki Nakamura here in Sweden. Pishkonski says, I just couldn't catch you. You were too fast for me. Nakamura takes third step on the podium. He's going to be happy with that. His whole team have worked tirelessly to retune and build that car between round one and round two. And boy, has it worked. Oh, man, has it worked? Has it worked? It's been phenomenal, Dave. But that is just the beginning of the show. Well, I'll tell you what, that was just the playoff. We are now in the moment that everyone's been waiting for. 51 drivers became 32, became 16, and now they become two. But there will be only one winner as we now head to the final. The stage is set. The two fastest men in Sweden this weekend sit on the line. Finland's Juha Rintanen will go head to head with Ireland's Dwayne McKeever. McKeever took second place here last year, but he doesn't want second place again. He wants first. Rintanen, he's taken everyone down this weekend without even breaking a sweat. This time, he's going to have to turn it up because McKeever is coming for it. They are focused. They are ready. This is two of the best in the business about to go door to door in the final in Sweden. And boy, are they ready. The cars are working. The grip is dialed in. They know exactly what they want to do here. And both of them have been unstoppable forces all the way through the competition. But one will win and one will lose. And we're about to find out. Here we go. Oh, look at this from Rinden already flying through. But McKeever on the back bumper. Big initiation. McKeever goes for it, but he can't match the pace. He's been outpaced by Yuha Rinden, who swings that car from left to right. And McKeever, the man that we said was fastest round this circuit, is now left in a cloud but Rittenden shortcuts the outside zone. And now McKeever starts to rein him back in. Can he find anything in that final outside zone? And he can't. And 
has you heart written and leaves the Irishman in a cloud of smoke. Who would have predicted it, Ian? I've never seen Dwayne McKeever left for pace at any event I've ever wow. been to. That is how on it Yuha Rintanen is this weekend. He's found something here that nobody else has found, and he found Watch it from... this. Look at this. Gone. He drives away from Dwayne McKeever. But he Dave. drives away on angle on the perfect qualifying line. He's not cutting the course. He's not trying to, you know, run away on purpose. There's no games being played there. That is just full throttle, full steam. And McKeever right now, he's panicking. He's thinking, how have I lost so much ground in the first two corners? I don't think Dwayne McKeever's ever felt slow behind the lead car, ever in drifting. And you got to remember that Rintanen has found some way of making this GR86 faster than anything else on the circuit this weekend. Incredible. Uh, unbelievable. Almost, again, no words. I, and I would have bet any money that Dwayne McKeever was the fastest man around this circuit. But it appears not because Yuha ridden and went away last night and he worked on their car and they've worked on it all day and they've dialed it in and they've tuned it. And he said that they've been dialing it in all weekend, every single run, they've been making adjustments. What have they done to that back car? Because if you gave it wings, it would be gone. It almost wheelied through the course there. It was going that fast. Incredible. Uh, but not only is it going fast, fast it's is fine. He's in control. But he's in control. He's on angle. Look at the precision to the edge of the track here. Absolutely perfection from Yuha Rintanen. And he's the only driver I said out there with the body language of a winner because he's standing there, cool, calm, says, I'm having fun, waving to the fans, smile on his face. That's a man you do not want to come up against because he's feeling like, I can win this easy. And it's not easy. That's the problem. No, it isn't easy. So it now McKeever, easy. McKeever goes into the lead position. Rintanen has, if he puts any level of proximity in here, he is going to win this event. But it's easier said than done. And Dwayne McKeever is going to say, right, what's my tactic? It's got to be really big angle, really fast from the off. Let's see if Rintanen can get the job done. But McKeever has something left in the tank. It is the final run of the weekend. McKeever to lead in. Rintanen, here we go. Yeah, look at this already Rintanen, not letting McKeever get away. McKeever fires that car on big angle, as you say, Dave. He's going to play the game, but it doesn't matter to you. Are written a little wobble, but he gets himself back into it again. As written and now works his way down into that transition over the hill. They go look in front of the grandstand. McKeever now starts to drive away from you. Har written and as you have written and makes a big dive into that final outside zone. He looks for the wheel and he gets there across the line. Incredible that McKeever makes an error on the first corner. I just noticed he misses that inside zone. He pushes a little bit too wide. It may have messed up Rintanen's chase run a little bit there, but either way. A little bit of proximity, not amazing proximity for Rintanen. Watch McKeever's line here. You think he pushes a little too wide. He's trying to get to that inner zone, remember, on the left-hand side of the track. But as he pushes through, it looks like the car washes for him. He misses that zone. Rintanen now kind of firing in in the chase position. And does McKeever have the correct uh, transition back? I'm not so sure. You can see Rintanen making errors, having to adjust in the car. Um, and it looked to me from that perspective that McKeever, not the perfect lead run, definitely not as good as Rintanen's. No, nowhere near as good as Rintanen's. And, and it pains me to say that at the about these guys at this level, but that's our job. We have to critique and look at this. Rintanen in the smoke, goes for the dive. They transition back. The proximity's there. A few wobbles and wavers for Yuha Rintanen, but I tell you what, Dave, the proximity, we've seen it all day. Oh, a wheel drop from wheel McKeever. Wheel drop from McKeever as well. Yeah, he's yeah. off the track. We saw Rintanen straighten up, but that could have been an evasive maneuver yeah, because to get McKeever, away from that. yeah, would have uh, dropped, you know, dropped a wheel and made it very difficult for Rintanen at that point. And Rintanen looks so calm, so controlled. Just, yeah, I'm up on the door. It's all fine. It's all good. Some pace to be that casual about it. So, an incredible stuff from Rintanen and Dwayne McKeever. McKeever, you can tell by the body language. I don't think he thinks he's got it. It might have to settle for a second place two years in a row on this circuit. Rintanen, look at the body language. Just checking the car. Everything's fine. That tape wasn't there this morning. Oh, that must be new. Um, must have hit something. He has a look in and says, Yeah, no, everything seems to be fine. I'm just checking my window wipers there, make sure they're still functional. He's so relaxed. And I think that's for me um, one of those things that's really stood out for me all weekend is how smooth how relaxed he's been and I mean if you look at the championship points on the table this is massive for either of these drivers for McKeever or Rintanen but one is going to take the win who is it going to be taking the win is it's Yuha Rintanen Rintanen takes the win at round two of the Driftmasters European Championship in Sweden the fans go absolutely crazy most of them finish in attendance and Dwayne McKeever is going to have to settle for second place my voice is gone my heart is beating and that is what this sport is all about unpredictable results you think you can predict it, you think you know what's going on, you know nothing. Sit back, watch, and watch the show. The circus rolling into town every weekend when Driftmasters comes through because it was all upside down this weekend. Everybody's going to feel like it was anyone's game, and the real reality is it was 
you have Rangelins to lose. He never made an error all the way through. A worthy winner, Ian. A certainly a worthy winner, Dave. What an, a phenomenal drive from Yuha written. And Becky's with Yuha. Let's see how he's feeling, Becky. Incredible scenes here. You are Rinson is our winner of round two at Drift Masters, and it's his first ever win at Drift Masters. You are, you must be absolutely delighted. I am. I am. This. I heard some noises in the car when we went from the line, but I just didn't care. And, ah, it was crazy. When you were coming through the smoke there, you, you seemed to have a little bit of a wobble. Were you still back on the power and didn't worry about it? Yeah, that, something's definitely off in the car. Uh, I think we have to take it apart after this round, but it's, we, at least we have a good reason for it, so it's good. Absolutely, you seem so calm. I'll give you that. Whenever anything is happening, whether it's good or bad, you have this total clarity and calmness. Inside, are you jumping up and down right now? Oh yeah, maybe it's coming later, so we'll see, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Forever the gentleman. Congratulations, Yuha, you deserve it. This was your round. Well, there we go. Yuha Rittenden wins round two of the 2023 Driftmasters European Championship, and he is absolutely belated. You can see the reaction he gets as Dwayne McKeever says again, the second step on the podium. But this weekend, those points, he will take it. I haven't done the maths, no one's done the maths yet. But here we go. Yuha Rittenden, the winner, takes the top step on the podium at round two of the 2023 Driftmasters European Championship. Dwayne McKeever takes the second step, and this season, a new entrance, Naoki Nakamura. Well, he takes a third step on the podium. Poland's very own Jakub Pushkonski takes fourth place and rounds it out. Laurie Heinen, and in fifth, still holds on to some of those precious championship points. We will see how that one unfolds after this weekend is done and how the championship is sitting. Kevin Pursu the Estonian sits in eighth place after the weekend and Jack Shanahan finishing in seventh again another driver holding on to some of those all-important championship points What an incredible event, guys. You know what I love about drifting is you never, ever know what is going to happen. His first ever win, Yuha Rintanen takes that top spot, and he is going to go back and party. He always is so calm and collected, but I know inside he is actually jumping up and down. I promise you. So let's take a look at our calendar that is coming. Sorry, let's take a look at our championship standings as the points will now become clear. In the first place, we have Dwayne McKeever. In second, Laurie Heinonen. In third, now Yuha Rintanen. That's John him up massively in those points. Fourth, Peter Viensek. Fifth, Jack Shanahan. Sixth, Connor Shanahan, right behind his brother. Seventh, Jakub Ryszkonski. And eighth, Naoki Nakamura. What an incredible season we've got ahead of us as well. We are just on round two, and there are three, there are three more coming, guys. So we're going to head for round three, where we're going to be heading to a brand new track on the 7th and 8th of July. We're going to be heading to the Power Park in Finland. I can't wait to see what happens here, because it's a new track for everybody, so it levels that playing field. In round four, we're going to head to Riga, Latvia, one of the fastest, most dangerous tracks on our calendar, and a huge fan favorite and driver favorite. And in round five, in August, we're going to head to Ferropolis, the Iron City in Germany, and then it all roads lead to round six in the PGE Arena in the biggest stadium we have ever, ever tried to fill. Now, Finland is the power park, as you can see on the screens here. I've never seen this track in person, so we can see the cars coming down. I cannot wait to see what happens here because you know what it's like when you have a brand new track, nobody's seen it. So it's all to play for. I mean, this event has thrown up a completely different uh, different result that we ever expected to so it's all to play for who knows what's going to happen in finland make sure that you do join us there we are really looking forward to joining you all again on red bull tv what an amazing event all there is to say is goodbye and we'll see you in four weeks